Welcome to Nimmin Live, the number one place on the internet to learn about YouTube, network with other content creators, and have an awesome time doing it. My name is Nick, and today I'm answering your YouTube questions. So if you have a question about what it is that you're doing on YouTube, there's a form down in the description where you can put your question in there right now. If you get it in there now, then we will get it answered on the stream today so we can get your question resolved. In addition to that, I do wanna let you know if you are watching or listening to this on the replay, that we do add timestamps to the version on YouTube. And the reason for that is because people come in and they're looking for answers to different questions, and it just makes it easy to find the answers to the questions that you might have. And in addition to that, it also might present some questions to you that you didn't know was in the stream without listening to it, or you can go down and find things that, you know, are important to you. But the thing that I really recommend that you do so you can learn the most is just sit back, listen, or watch this live stream so that you can absorb all this YouTube information. And um, the whole point of this is to, you know, help you get going with what it is that you're doing on YouTube. So <clears throat> with all that out of the way, I do want to let you know that today's stream is brought to you by TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is the number one tool for YouTube content creators. It'll help you optimize your videos for discovery. TubeBuddy will help you Test your thumbnails to make sure that the thumbnails that you are using are effective for the people that you are trying to reach. In addition to that, TubeBuddy has 90 different tools that'll help you in a bunch of different ways. So if you're a content creator, TubeBuddy should be a part of your toolkit. You can find out what TubeBuddy can do for you if you go to TubeBuddy.com slash Nimmin. This stream is co-brought to you, and I got links to everything down in the description as well as a bunch of other helpful tools and resources for you as well. But this stream is co-brought to you by StreamYard, which is the live streaming platform I use to live stream this every Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern. And the reason that I use StreamYard is because it's super easy. It They make it really easy to start the stream. They make it really easy to get started with live streams if you're somebody that's just getting started. They make it easy to add graphics to the stream they make it easy to bring on guests if you bring guests on that you can add background music and it's reliable and if your internet goes down or your electric goes down or anything like that temporarily Streamyard will hold your stream open so you don't lose everybody that was hanging out in your live stream which is a super big future feature just by itself so make sure that you check out Streamyard at streamyard.com with all that out of the way, super excited to get uh, streaming today. So uh, if you are hanging out here, you notice that my brother from the same mother, D, is not here right now. That is because he and Daniel Batal, they have a live stream later on over on the StreamYard YouTube channel. Once we get to the very end of this live stream, what's going to happen is once I end this, you can just automatically just go over there and hang out there. They're going to be on channel reviews. So that's definitely something that you're going to want to stick around for, especially if you're one of the people that's been wanting some feedback on your YouTube channel, because what they do there is they do the channel reviews, but as part of the channel reviews, they also set the whole thing up like a game show. So it's super fun. You're gonna love it, really good time. <laughs> so with all that out of the way, we're gonna go ahead and get into the questions today so we can get started with the content. But before we do, um, I just want to give a couple of really quick shout outs. What's going on, Cyber Beast? Nice to see you in here. Doug Houston, what's going on? Nice to see you here. Chantel Hills, welcome to the stream. Hope that you're doing great. Stormy Skyrail Productions, hope that you are doing fantastic as well. Creator Classroom. Everybody that's hanging out here, Game Punk, hope everybody's doing fantastic and ready to learn about YouTube today. Um, one thing that I do recommend is that if you are a Tube Spanner user, which everybody here should be, go ahead and get your notepad open. Um, if you're not familiar with what Tube Spanner is, it is a browser extension and a CMS um, or website that has a bunch of really helpful tools for content creators as well. Um, it's a totally different tool than you know TubeBuddy or any of the other you know YouTube tools, um, and it helps you in a bunch of different ways. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, you can check that out at tubespanner.com. But go ahead and get the notepads open for anybody that is already a tube spanner user. And getting this party started right, Mr. Waves him uh, himself reacts. Super chat. Thank you for the super chat. I don't have the super sticker sound. I got to get that from D. <laughs> So here we go. So Beneath Steel Rain says, I finally got the alert notification on time. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. My C Prince, what's going on, dude? Hope that you are doing fantastic. And hey, if this is your first time here in the live stream, one thing that I would like to encourage you to do. Hit the sub button. Hit the like button. If you're having fun, comment, type something. If you're laying back, leaning and engaged. Take a second to smash the whole page. Smash the whole page. You know, do the uh, do the thing, all the things that, you know, that we do as 
YouTubers. So the very first question that we have, and again, I'm pulling these from the form that is down in the description of this live. Do you guys like that? <laughs> I'm pulling this from the form that is down in the description right now. So if you do have a question, make sure that you uh, put that uh, down in the form right now. So the very first question is from the Dream Builder. The Dream Builder does daily content. They've been on YouTube for less than a year. They do automotive content. And the goal of the channel is to entertain people with my projects to distract them from their day and to turn my model car collection into the real thing. And the question is, can you explain in more detail how traffic sources work in analytics so that I have a better understanding of them? I've only just had enough data to work with to understand my audience. Absolutely. So when it comes to, hey, Crispy Skates, what's going on? Chatty Kathy, nice to see you. So when it comes to traffic sources on YouTube, um, what the reference is here, if you're a new content creator, inside of every single video that you publish to YouTube, they give you information um, about your videos. They give you all kinds of different things. So one of the things that they give you is what pages on YouTube are you getting views from? Like, are you pulling most of them from your channel page because you're trying to push people over there from shorts? Are you pulling uh, most of the people from YouTube's homepage? Are you pulling people to your video mostly from the subscription feed or from YouTube search? They give us this information. In order to find it, you go into the content for any video that you have, click into any of your videos, click into your YouTube analytics, for any of those very specific videos. And then you want to go to the very top right-hand corner if you're on a desktop and or on a computer, and you're gonna see an option for advanced mode. Click into that, and then you're gonna see some tabs going across the, uh, the middle of the page there. Click on traffic sources. That's where you're gonna see the information that I'm getting ready to talk about. So what your traffic sources report is, is it shows you how your videos perform on each individual page of YouTube. So for example, typically if people are coming in from suggested videos, how often are they clicking um, in terms of you know, your impressions, how often YouTube is showing your content there, your click-through rate in terms of YouTube showed your content to people this many times in suggested videos, this many people clicked on it. And then when they clicked on it, it'll show you like how much of a percentage viewed um, is are people experiencing when they are coming in from suggested videos. You can also see total watch time when people are coming in from suggested videos as well. Um, so you can pull a whole bunch of you know additional metrics that are awesome to know and help you troubleshoot problem areas when you find yourself lacking in some traffic sources. And I'm gonna talk about the, that in detail here in just a second. So the next thing, is you can also go into browse. Now, when you go into browse, what you're gonna see in there is you're gonna see your um, subscriptions and you're going to see your, uh, you're gonna see your homepage. So same exact thing, you're gonna see your impressions, your click-through rate, how long people are watching your videos when they come in from there. Same exact thing from uh, uh, search as well. For those of you that share your content elsewhere, one of the things that you can do there is you can also go in and you can see external. So you're not gonna be able to see the click-through rate on external because YouTube isn't actually giving impressions there, but one of the things that you are going to see, is you're going to see how long people are watching for. So for those of you that are sharing your videos to Reddit, or you're sharing your videos to Pinterest, or you're sharing your videos to Facebook, or wherever else, or in Discord groups, whatever, then in that particular case, you can go in and you can look and see. And if you're just joining us, we're talking about traffic sources on YouTube, and basically what they mean and what you can pull from traffic sources. But you can go in for the external traffic source, and you can say, okay, Facebook, how long do people watch when they come in on Facebook? Because a view versus a view that's satisfied, those are two totally different things. So if somebody comes into the video, if you have a lot of people coming in from like Facebook or Discord, for example, but they're leaving your videos really quickly and you can see that by the percentage view there, then that gives you an indication that those particular groups are probably not the best place. So instead, you might wanna find a place that's more appropriate for the content or just not share there at all and just leverage YouTube by itself for all the traffic, right? Um, so, how you wanna look at these different traffic sources is in terms of problem solving, is if you are trying to rank your videos in YouTube search, then in that particular case, if that's like your focus, right, then you need to make sure that you're paying attention to how your videos perform there. So then you would use those particular metrics to see how your videos are performing in search. If you are trying to get more homepage traffic, then you would look for that. And if you notice, hey, I'm, I'm doing great in YouTube search, but my homepage and suggested traffic is not doing that great, then what that tells you is, okay, when people are looking for what you've made, 
you're able to get a good response there and people are coming in and they're enjoying the content there. But if you find that like you can't get people to click when it comes to home pages and suggested videos in comparison, then that tells you like, okay, if somebody's looking for it, I can grab their attention and pull them in. But if somebody is on YouTube just randomly looking at other stuff and YouTube presents my content to them there, then I'm just, I'm not as good at, as pulling people in from that. And because of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to think about, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to think to myself, if my target viewer, the person that I'm trying to reach with this content, if they were to see my videos show up on YouTube's homepage, what about this thumbnail? What about this title? What about this topic would be important to them enough to where they would want to come in and they would want to watch the video. And you want to start getting really granular with, granular with this. Like what exactly about my thumbnail would grab their attention and help them identify this is something that they might care about? What exactly about my title would be informative about this video or would be compelling um, in order to, or create a curiosity gap of some time, some type. Um, but what about this title would be the thing that would pull that person that I was able to stop and grab their attention that would pull them into the video that I made right? And start asking yourself those questions. And when you do, then it helps you fine tune things and it helps you get a better response overall. So if all that makes sense, just say, uh, just say yes, or give me a thumbs up or give me some of these, these hearts or, you know, something like that. <laughs> iPhone Chris says member for 15 months. Awesome. Thank you for your support. My man beneath steel rain. Welcome to the Niminati. Welcome to the Niminati. Make sure when you get the chance, you go to NimminVIP.com. This, if it's something that you're interested in, this is going to redirect you to our members only Facebook group. If you can, if you can do that before the stream's over today, then as soon as the stream is complete, I can let you into the group. In addition to that, as a channel member, I want you to know that we have a Discord that anybody here can join. I've got a link to it down in the description. Chantel's also dropped a handful of links in here for it as well. But um, in our community discord, anybody can join that, but there is a members only area as well. So if you are a channel member and you are in discord, make sure that you also are, you know, going into the discord um, so that you can also, you know, uh, hang out with everybody, you know, the other channel members in that area as well. All right, so um, next up on our list here for the questions, I hope that uh, satisfied your curiosity there, Dream Builder. And again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about everything YouTube. My job here today is hopefully demystify some aspect of YouTube that you're having trouble with um, so that hopefully, you know, it can help you get better results into the future. Um, the questions that I'm answering are pulled from the description. There's a form down in the description where you can put your question for free and I'm answering them in the order that they are received. So if you are just joining us, and you have a question, make sure you put it in that form. And if you get in there now, it will get answered on the stream today. So next question that we have is um, from Design Burst. Uh, Design Burst, they do bi-weekly content. They've been on YouTube for less than a year. Um, they do interior design content. The goal of the channel is to educate our viewers about interior design. And the question is, from your own experience, is SEO optimization effective? Yes, it is. It's, it's very effective, um, especially if you're promoting something as an affiliate. Um, if you're a business owner and you are trying to generate leads from YouTube, you can get it from the recommendation features as well. But when you search target very specific things that, that your target audience is interested in or things that they want to know about, then absolutely SEO optimization is extremely effective. But keep in mind, when it comes to SEO optimization, the quality of your video content is a major factor there. And something that you have to think about is when it comes to a search term on YouTube, you have tons of people that are going for that same search term. So what's going to happen is the ones that are the most competitive in terms of watch time or watch time per impression or viewer satisfaction for that search term, those are gonna be the ones that are prioritized at the top. So because of that, you have to make sure that, that you're not just thinking about the metadata itself in terms of like your title and your description, right? Because YouTube is also like watching the video and more importantly, like viewers are watching the video. So you can have the perfect SEO optimization with your title, perfect SEO optimization with your description, and you can do other things as well. And if your video falls short in terms of the response that people have to that video, then it's not going to stay there. Right. So because of that, the easy part, which is just, you know, updating some words or phrases in your in your title and description, that part's easy. The hard part is making a video that's competitive for that term. So if you are search targeting a piece of content, make sure that you are looking and that you are watching all of the other 
um, videos that you're going to be competing with. I mean, not all of them, but like, let's say the top five or 10 videos that you're going to be competing with, eh, five is, is probably fine. Really three, you'd be okay. But five, if you really want to do the due diligence, right? But, um, but just watch those top five videos. And when you do that, um, you are wanting to think about, okay, how are they starting this video? How are they grabbing attention? Go and look at the comments of those videos. Is there anything that people are saying that this person left out of the video? Because maybe if I don't get the number one spot here, maybe I might get the number two, but if I start my video and I mention that I'm going to answer something that that first person left out, then in that particular case, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, fulfill that need for people and let them know right out of the gate, which means they'll probably end up watching my video for a while in order to get that information, right? So you got to make sure that you are not just using the metadata, but that you are thinking about the video and that you are doing that research so that you can really compete. Zach Talks Tech, thanks for your support. Says, um, this stream is part of my Saturday morning routine. Appreciate all the work Nick does for the community. Thanks, my man. Super appreciate that. Um, I'm going to be responding to you on Twitter um, on either Monday or Tuesday so we can get our thing uh, scheduled as well, by the way. So, uh, so, here, so next up on our list, uh, we're on number three now for the questions. And again, if you are just joining us, we're talking about everything YouTube related. So if you are a YouTube content creator, this is the spot to be in on Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Technically, T, what's up, dude? Hope you are doing great. Shark Scrapper, nice to see you in here. Zara, hope that you are doing fantastic. Home Rapid Repair, nice to see you here as well. Number three. Zen Bloke is the name of the YouTube channel. They've been on YouTube for a year or more. They do gaming culture content. The goal of the channel is to share my love and knowledge of gaming and entertain along the way. And the question is, in the last few months, I've seen some fantastic growth on my little gaming culture channel, but it seems to have stalled. Could you take a look under the hood? Um, as you say, as you Americans say, and figure out what to do next. So um, we are not looking at channels at this point of the stream. Um, I might pull something out, you know, a little bit later, you know, like as we're kind of, you know, landing the plane, so to speak. But as of, uh, you know, right now, we're, we're not looking at uh, channels at this moment. Um, so next up on the list here. Learn Spanish World is the next uh, uh, channel here on the list. They do educational content. The goal of the channel is to provide a wide range of Spanish learning videos to my community while trying to do this full time eventually. Um, the question is, hey, Nick, just wondering what's happening with YouTube courses. Any new updates? Um, how's it going to work? I heard last year that courses would be introduced in 2023, but nothing yet. Any news? What's happening? Many thanks. So I had the opportunity to test this, but I didn't load up anything into it. This is a feature. This is something that they are rolling out. Uh, basically, how it works is you upload videos into a playlist and you lock that playlist down. Really easy um, in terms of the process, but uh, but that's how courses work in a nutshell. And then if somebody wants access to that, then they're going to you know click the button for access, and then YouTube is going to you know ask them for that payment. So uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be fairly easy. All you have to do is just wait for it to you know wait for it to show up. But keep in mind, um, you know in the meantime, you can use UScreen. Right, you can just go to uscreen.tv. Um, you can set that up, and then you can just use that in the meantime, or you can just you know drive everybody that you are helping over to that area. Oh, let's see here, Bubble T. Kristen, thanks for swinging by. Glad that you are enjoying the content, Luke Nightingale. Glad that you uh, that you like the uh, the office here. Next up, the Creator Classroom. Uh, they do Canva tutorials. The goal of the channel is to help creators use Canva for YouTube. The question is, how do you know the best way to package a title and thumbnail for different reaches? How viewers find the video? And how do you determine which type of package to actually do for your channel? This is a huge struggle for me. Um, this is something that you need to think about, but try not to overthink it, right? So when it comes to the different traffic sources of YouTube, which I think is the, you know, the thing that you're going for here. So best way to package a title and thumbnail. So first you gotta start at the topic of the video itself, right? The best way to do this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about what you should do in terms of packaging it, but I'm also going to talk about the, the order in which you should do things. So the order in which you should do things is this. You come up with your video idea, you research that video idea to see how competitive it is, to see you know, if there's a, you know, some unique spin that you could put on it or whatever to make something that stands out against everybody else who's made something similar and so on. So you come up with the video idea, you, you research that video idea. If you're gonna target that video for YouTube search, then in that particular case, then you would do the additional research for that. Um, from there, once you're like, yeah, you know what I think so far, I'm qualifying this, this is something that I want to make for the channel, then, you need to think about, okay, how am I going to present this from the outside, okay? And the reason you wanna think about that is because let's say that I was selling this, you know, let, let's say, well, yeah, it's probably better. So let's say 
that I was selling this remote control. Well, as part of selling this remote control, one of the things that I would have to think about is, okay, I can't just give it to people like this. If I'm gonna you know, sell it in a shop or something like that, I need to make a package for it. I need to put it in a box. I need to make that box attractive from the outside. I need to make it clear. I gotta put it in the right section of the store, right? All those things. But on the front of the box, what I'm probably gonna have is I'm probably gonna have just a nice big picture of this remote or somebody using the remote or something like that so that it's clear for people when they're shopping that they see that, hey, this is a remote. So then when they're looking for that, then it's you know clear to them. Um, and even if they're not looking for it, if they happen to walk by if they're in that section of the store and they happen to walk by and they see it and it's got a big remote on the box they might think to themselves like oh yeah that's right um i i, I remembered i need to get a remote right so youtube's the same exact way when you come up with the idea you research the idea to qualify it then the next thing you want to do is you want to come up with the packaging of that video and you want to think about how am i going to represent this from the outside so yes i know what i'm going to put in the video but how am I going to make this clear for people who don't already know what the video content itself is, right? So the very first thing that you do is you think to yourself, okay, if somebody were to see this video randomly on YouTube, if the person that I'm targeting with my content were to see this, what about this thumbnail would grab their attention and help them identify this as something that they might care about? In your case, since you are helping content creators use Canva, Canva might be something to where you might wanna put that logo in there. Maybe you wanna put social media logos, something like that. But you wanna make sure that there's one clear focus in your video. And everybody here, same exact thing. You wanna make sure that there's one clear focus or focal point in your thumbnail that is designed to grab the attention of people who are interested in a particular thing so that you can use that to help them identify that the content's about something they care about, okay? One focal point. And then the next thing that you do from there is you think to yourself, okay, now here's the focal point. Is there anything supportive that I can put in here? Um, if yes, then if I do put it in there, is any of this other stuff that I'm going to add to my thumbnail going to distract away from that focal point? If it is, how can I minimize that so that it doesn't distract from the focal point? Um, or should I just completely remove it and just have the focal point in there and keep everything relatively simple, right? So that's step number one, and that's just for the thumbnail. Next, you can use like Tube Spanner, for example, once you make the thumbnail, because they have a tool where you can basically just upload it into the, to the browser extension, and then you can just hit to check it, and then it'll just show it to you randomly in just a random spot on YouTube's homepage. And then there you can say, okay, well, this is randomly showing my video on YouTube's homepage. Does it stand out against all these other random videos, which is similar to what a, just a random viewer would see if they just logged into YouTube? So does it stand out? Yes, it does. Okay, next thing. Now we gotta do the title. Now, the important thing to think about here is that your thumbnail and your title always work together as a team to win the click. Technically, it's your topic, your title, and your thumbnail. But I just have to be careful how I express that because it can come out wrong if you get what I'm saying. So because of that, <laughs> you got to think, you know, okay, topic, you know, is this interesting, you know, to enough people, the packaging in terms of the thumbnail, is this going to, you know, help somebody, uh, you know, uh, you know, is it going to grab their attention? And then for the title, then you got to think, okay, with this title, yes, I'm going to be informative and let them know, you know, what this is about. That's this, the first step, right? Can I just be informative here and just let them clearly know what this is about so that I can guarantee that I'm going to meet their expectations as they come into the video, right? Um, oh, and you can also look at it and you can think to yourself, okay, is there anything that I can do here to make it compelling? Can I add a time limit to it? Like, you know, whatever the video title is in under X amount of time right? Or, uh, you know, three things, you know, uh, Canva users, um, you know, t three features camera users, you know, don't know exist or something like that. Because then when you add the don't know exist in there, then in that particular case, then for the Canva users, it's like, oh, well, I wonder, you know, what those things could be. So it creates a curiosity gap. And then those people, you know, could come in from that. So the whole idea, the whole thing I'm trying to express is you want to think of it all together, right? Topic, uh, topic thumbnail and title and you want to think of how all of those things work together and you want to think about identification for the thumbnail right and you want to think about um, informative and compelling for the title if you do that and then you do it all before you commit to making the video then the best part about this whole thing is you can know okay if i'm packaging it up this way then it's probably going to create an expectation of this 
So because of that, let me start my video by confirming that expectation that they might have to let them know that they're in the right place and to let them know I'm going to give them exactly what it is that I'm predicting they're going to anticipate coming into this video. If you do all that, you'll start getting more clicks on your videos and you'll start creating a more satisfactory experience for your viewers because you're gonna be able to give them exactly what it is that they expect and you're gonna be able to design everything from the outside and you're gonna be able to package it up and, and confirm that packaging before you make the content itself. So hopefully that answered your question. So really quick, you know, just, just as some feedback here, do you, for everybody here, do you make your thumbnails and titles before you make the videos or do you make the videos and then last minute you think to yourself, oh boy, what am I going to do for a, for a thumbnail and title here? <laughs> right. If, if you're that, if you're in the second camp, start being in the first camp, right? Start being in that group to where you don't have to fully make the thumbnail, but what you do want to do is you want to think to yourself, you know, okay, write it down. Okay. So the thumbnail will be like a two panel thumbnail over on this side. I'll have this over on this side. I'll have this, this thing over here is going to be, you know, the thing that's going to grab the attention. And then it's going to, you know, lead people over into this thing. And then their eyes going to drop down to the title, which is going to save this. Right. Um, and then by doing that, it's, it's going to help you, you know, perform better. Luke Nightingale. Welcome to the Nimminati. Welcome to the Nimminati. Make sure when you get the chance, you go to nimminvip.com. If you're interested in joining our Facebook group, um, we also have a Discord. So if you are a Discord user, there's a link to that down in the description. We have a, a members only area in Discord as well. It's free to everybody, but we also have a members only area um, inside of Discord as well. So if you want to get like the full thing going there, then in that case, you know, make sure that you're a part of uh, a part of both. Because like some things that I'll do is I'll drop some things in Discord or, you know, um, something like that. And then I'll drop them in Facebook or sometimes I'll drop it in Facebook and then I'll, you know, get it over to Discord next time I'm in Discord, stuff like that. So uh, so ha being in both is is the is the best option, um, of course. Um, let's see here. So just for some feedback here. So we have um, thumbnails can indeed inspire the content. Um, I'm literally writing a script about this right now. Fantastic. Uh, living in Omaha says video first. Yeah, start start thinking of that backwards, uh, David. Technically, T says always done it that way, but my niche is a little one way, so um, there isn't much thought into it. Yeah, so like in your case, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. Nerd Jen, thank you for the super chat. Super chat. Says, hey, Nick, I wear a lot of hats. Welcome to being a content creator, right? Uh, this is in essence, uh, the priority pays the bills. How to make the time to find the right editor and content manager without breaking the bank. So um, what you can do is you can just go straight to a site called ytjobs.com. Uh, that particular site is made by uh, Patty Galloway and he vets every service provider in there so that you don't have to you know, rack your brain trying to find people. You can just go there. Keep in mind, everybody there is experienced. Everybody there you know, has been vetted. And because of that, you, know, you are going to pay you know, reasonable prices over there. If you're looking to save money, then in that case, you can go to onlinejobs.ph. Um, the, the .ph is for the Philippines. Um, you can post there. You can post on Upwork and other places like that with a very detailed instruction of exactly Exactly what it is that you're looking for and then you know start feeding uh start uh, uh um, filtering through people then once you start getting some some responses there but when it comes to you know the time side you know there is that but other things you can do too is you can hop on youtube and start looking for you know people that are sharing like video editing tips and things like that some of those people offer editing um there's all kinds of you know things like that that you can do also same on tiktok um i've actually you know been in contact with some shorts creators over there trying to find you know somebody that is really good at making modern looking you know youtube shorts um so you know uh you know those types of things are also are also good but again just to just to name those upwork.com um, technically you have brickwork.com also which or it might be dot in but it's it's basically an indian uh outlet for jobs um, you also have online jobs.ph which is the philippines and then you have yt jobs it's either dot co or dot com i think both of them go to the uh to the same place Teach online with Jillian says started making the thumbnail first and it's made a huge difference. Love it. Video and then the thumbnail. Yeah, definitely start reversing that. Videos come first, thumbnail second. Definitely start reversing that. Um, let's see here. What else do we got? Thank you. Um, I'm Ty for Discord to help me today on the Japanese channel. Nice, nice, nice. Usually write the titles before, make thumbnails after, but after crafting the thumb in my head and on paper as I create the video. Nice. Okay, yeah, some good feedback there. Brian G. Johnson. 
in the house. What's up, my dude? Hope that you are doing fantastic. He says, I, as I script the title and thumbnail evolve, honestly, I outsource my thumbnails to my two poodles. They grind, right? I mean, they make, they make, they make good thumbnails. I mean, you know, I mean, if I had two poodles, you know, I'm trying to train popcorn on, on thumbnails, but he's, uh, he's just not getting it yet. So, uh, so instead what I have to do is I have to put him in, uh, in videos. Hit the sub button, hit the like button. If you're having fun, comment, type something. If you're laying back, leaning and engage. Just take a second to smash the whole page. Next question that we have on our list here is from trying to learn bikes, trying to learn bikes. Uh, they do DIY motorcycle maintenance content. Um, the goal of the channel is I upload videos for the challenge. And the question is in YouTube studio, when I select the subtitle tab and I look at languages for each of my video uploads, it indicates the number two. Um, I've never added a second language to any videos. And I'm curious as to why it shows two. Can you tell me what that's all about? Thank you in advance for your always excellent advice. So you'll have your, um, your native language that you upload the video in and then YouTube's the second one will be YouTube automatically generating captions for that video. Um, and one thing I do want to let everybody know here is when it comes to uh, when it comes to captioning your videos and adding translations. So you may or may not know this, but if you are a TubeBuddy user, one of the things that they have built in. So basically every video on YouTube, one of the things that you can do right now with your content is you can go in to your uh subtitles area you can caption your subtitles in whatever languages that you want tubebuddy um if you go into the metadata section of that tubebuddy has a thing to where it'll show you the primary languages at the bottom you can also find this in your geographic information and your analytics but it shows you the primary languages and then from there um, you can also use tubebuddy you just hit the translate button and then it'll translate your metadata so it'll translate your title and your description and then you can just hit save it's a really fast process and it makes your content more accessible for people that are in other countries and that speak other languages as well so uh, so, here, so next up on the list, that was a little side, little side tip we're squeezing in there with the, uh, with the answer to the question. So next up, we've got <laughs> Hybrid Steel's requesting the coffee song. Yeah, we'll do that one here. Uh, we'll do that one here a little bit later. So uh, Game Punk is our next question. Um, Game Punk. They do daily content, been on YouTube for a year or more. They do, uh, the goal of the channel is to share my passion of gaming and to be my stable reason of monetary income. Question, are videos less than two or three minutes um, a better way of cre increasing my YouTube reach? I'm asking this because I noticed that some other channels who upload less than two minutes immediately gained, gained a lot of views in the first hours compared to my longer videos than eight minutes. Is this some kind of trick? Appreciate your response. No. So when it comes to your videos, um, what you're ultimately going for is you are trying to create what YouTube calls satisfaction. People can be satisfied with a two or three minute video just as much as they can be satisfied with a 30 minute video. But the difference is with a 30 minute video, you're going to be stacking on massive amounts of watch time. And because of that, those are probably going to do okay. However, if you can do a two to three minute video and you can have people, you know, watching a very high percentage viewed on those, then those can also perform well also. Because because basically what you want to think about is you want to think about watch time per impression. So if you have a 30 minute video and somebody, you know, clicks on that 30 minute video, maybe they're going to make it all 30 minutes. Maybe they're going to make it for five. But if, if the general, you know, people are making it for five minutes and YouTube is showing that 30 minute video to the same amount of people that you are uh, having your two to three minute video shown to. And let's say that you are getting people through, um, let's say it's a three minute video. You're getting people through, you know, the first minute. Then in that particular case, you know, both of those, you know, are getting people through the initial parts of it, but the other one, uh, the 30 minute video is collecting a lot more watch time on that, which it per impression, which then will probably get that one prioritized. But the reality though, is that no two videos on YouTube are the same. And you know, the people that are seeing those videos at different times, they're all different things like that. So the best thing you can do is you make videos that are the long enough length that it is satisfactory for your viewers in terms of don't fluff the video out just for the sake of fluffing the video out. 
give them content for the whole time and learn how to edit, learn how to put content together so that you can cause people to watch videos for a longer period of time. What you might find if you go into your eight minute videos, you might find that people aren't making it that far in your eight minute videos. So you can go into your audience retention reports, which is something that is available for every content creator on every video that you publish. Doesn't matter if it's a live stream, if it is a uh, long form video, or if it's a YouTube short, you get this information. So you go into your audience retention reports and you can see exactly where people are dropping off. I've got details in this in the last video that I published, so make sure that you check that out for more you know, in-depth info on that. But the idea is to go in and start figuring out like, okay, are people just not enjoying these eight minute videos? Or are those two minute videos that you're talking about or those three minute videos, are they just really good at getting people to click and be satisfied? Where maybe once you get people into the video content, you're okay there, but maybe you're just having trouble getting people to click, right? So just like learning all of those aspects of it. And it's not just one thing, it's the whole thing, right? It's all of the things. So because of that, you know, you have to, you know, you have to do it all. Smash the whole page. <laughs> All right, next up, we got Circle H Scuba. Um, they do scuba education, talking head content. The goal of the channel is build a full-time income while educating drivers and those interested in starting divers and those interested in starting to scuba dive. The question is, I have an opportunity with the sponsor for recruiting placement for recurring placement in videos. It would be similar to your show sponsors in that one video per month, I'd have 30 to 60 second segment saying something like all the footage you're seeing um, I've taken was captured on and then the name of the product, which is the sponsor of this channel. How would you price this? I've done flat rate dedicated videos before, but never this kind of deal. So take your flat, multiply that by however many videos that you're gonna do, and then shave, hopefully you're charging more for single videos, and then shave a little bit off the top to give them a discount for doing multiple videos with you. Um, that's, that's the basic approach when you're getting multi you know, uh, video deals like that. Also, I would try to not do a 60 second placement. That's an entire minute. That's an entire YouTube short of an ad, right, of an ad read. So because of that, I would try to keep it to 30 seconds um, or less if you can, because, you know, keep in mind, people come onto YouTube, they see ads as they're coming in, some people do, um, and, you know, people are there for the content. So if you are going to do some type of promotional thing, you wanna try to make it relatively quick, right? So I wouldn't do a full minute. Um, I would work it out to where you're doing, you know, 30 seconds is the max on those, because, you know, really, you don't need to talk about the thing for a minute to spread awareness about it. Um, you just need to mention the thing, show the thing, let people know that you have more information about it down in the description if they would also like to use it for their scuba trips. You don't need to go for a full minute, you know, talking, talking about it. This will also respect your viewers' time also, and it will cause less people to abandon the video, which usually people will skip that stuff, though. Um, you know, I'm like, if they're, if they're bothered by it, not everybody's skipping them, but I'm just saying, like, if somebody's bothered by it, then they'll just skip it. Um, so Brandon uh, Bautista is our next question here. They upload when they have time. The type of channel is helping uh, people over 40 stay creative. The goal of the channel is to help middle-aged people like me who are juggling full-time jobs and family responsibilities get started following their creative passions. Um, the question is, I'm picking up tons of views and subscribers on a recent video I made about a specific camera. More in the past, uh, past month than in the pre previous 17 years I've had the channel. Whoa, nice work. But I feel like they're subscribing, expecting more content about the same camera, which I don't intend to do. How do I ride this wave of high engagement while staying true to the purpose of my channel, helping people over 40 follow their creative passions? I don't want to mislead people, nor do I want to shut down this new influx of amazing engagement and super positive, encouraging comments. So there's something on YouTube where you hear, you know, people that know about YouTube talk about how the algorithm follows the audience is what YouTube says too. So you can also do that as a content creator to where if you have people to where people are starting to respond to this thing, the whole thing is you're bringing people in that are creatives. So if you're like, okay, I got this camera, this camera's taken off, the people that are, that are loving my content right now, these people are interested in cameras, they're creatives who are interested in cameras. So because of that, maybe I should talk more about that. Or maybe instead of talking about cameras on my next video, maybe I should talk about like framing and you know, general principles of video production. You know, Maybe I should talk about those types of things. But basically think about all of those people that are coming in and enjoying that content, you don't have to make keep making videos on that same camera, but people are responding to that. So because of that, you might want to follow it up with a few just for the sake of continuing that momentum. And then once you run out of things to do there, then think to yourself, okay, 
So I've got, you know, three or four videos on this thing. Now I'm going to start teaching them, you know, deeper concepts about, you know, more creative things about, you know, using this camera or using any camera so that it's more accessible to more people. But those people also, uh, you know, could also come and enjoy it. Oh, uh, see here, Matt Cave Gaming. Thank super you for the super chat. chat. One of, says, I uh, want to say thank you. I just passed 5,000 subscribers. Thanks to implementing the tips that I've learned from you, as well as from D and Daniel. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for all that you do. High five and fist bump to you. Congratulations for, uh, for crossing your first 5,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, let's see here. My pleasure, Brandon. So next up, we've got... And by the way, if you are just joining us, we're talking about everything YouTube. So if you're watching this on another platform, um, depending on if you have descriptions available or not, depending on where you're watching this, there's a form down in the description on YouTube and some other platforms where you can put your questions and we are answering them in the order that they are received. So if you have a question, make sure that you do get into that form. If you're on a platform that doesn't show the descriptions, head over to YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash Nick Nimmin, then you will see you know the live stream happening there and then you can come in and uh, go down to the video description where you'll find that form. And uh, Doug, uh, just mentioned here that I missed a super chat earlier as well. So I'm just going up here to look at, oh, I see it. Mr. Waves himself reacts. Super chat. Says, what do you suggest? Posting 15 minutes before your peak time um, or and an hour before your peak time. Um, so what I recommend is basically when you have the, um, you have like the dark purple and then you have the, you know, the one before that and then you have the none. When you have the one, you know, before the, or the brightest, when you have the one that's before the brightest purple, publish there so you can ride the wave. You want to catch people as they're coming on while you're peaking and then as people start to go off. And also keep in mind, this is a quick side note, that initial video performance does not necessarily reflect long-term long video performance on YouTube. So, um, so just keep that in mind as well. But yeah, you want to publish it right around that time. If you're live streaming, it's a little bit different because you need people to be online, you know, as many people as possible to get people into your live stream. So because of that, you might want to publish, you know, what, when you're at those peak times, when you're in the bright purple, because then you have people that are online in terms of the most people online. So those uh, that's increasing your likelihood of those people getting recommended your live streams and then coming in there and hanging out. Uh, let's see here. So next up on our list, we got Fish Camp TV. They have a fishing channel. Goal of the channel is to create a lasting brand on a subject that I love. Love that. Um, the question is, my channel is growing more slow than expected. Um, I found some of the causes. One thing that perplexes me is... Sometimes, even with a high average watch time video, YouTube either shorts me on the impressions, randomly gives me way fewer than usual, or gives me nonsensical search traffic. The traffic I get from search is totally unrelated to phishing. So, okay, here's, here's, what, here's the thing. So when it comes to you getting a higher average watch time on a video, keep in mind that when you have lower viewed videos or videos with lower impressions on them, it's going to seem that way. But as you get more impressions on a video and you have more people coming into the video, it's harder to maintain those higher metrics, which is why you see everything getting pushed down the more views that you typically get. So the people that are amazing are the people that can get hundreds of millions of views or millions of views, and they can still maintain really high competitive metrics. Those are the people that are dominating YouTube. For us mere mortals, you know, we have to get it to where, you know, we are competitive for the space that we're operating in and that we're competitive for all the different content that YouTube is showing our audiences. So when it comes to, you know, people coming into your video, if you get 100 views on that video, it's going to seem like, oh, wow, you know, we, we got a really high retention here. The click-through rate's, you know, typically higher. But as YouTube's showing that content to more and more people and people are responding to it differently, different traffic sources and stuff, then you're going to start seeing all of those numbers, usually, not always, but usually you're going to start seeing all of those numbers go down. Now, keep in mind, sometimes it'll go like this, right? But, but if you get a million views, your metrics are going to look way different than if you get a thousand views. Okay. So just keep that in mind when it comes to looking at the metrics and then blaming YouTube for the performance of the video. Um, in addition to that, 
when you say that YouTube gives you nonsensical search traffic um, to where it's unrelated to phishing, um, that's fine. But one thing that you might want to do is you might want to just make sure that if you are going after YouTube search, because you know your videos might not be suited for search, but if you're trying to get your videos to show up in YouTube search, make sure that you are optimizing them for search. Because if not, then YouTube could just test your videos in places based on how you've optimized the content. I mean, their system's going to be watching the videos and they caption the videos. So they know what you're saying and all that. They know what you're showing in the videos and everything. But, you know, depending on uh, uh, how you are optimizing the video in terms of the uh, title and the description, that can also make a difference on where your videos are showing up. So because of that, you want to make sure that you are being mindful of that and looking and making sure that you are optimizing the content for fishing related topics as well to just kind of help you know, increase the relevance for it being, you know, um, fishing, uh, being, uh, 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 showing up in search for fishing related things. Um, let's see here. Uh, resolve VR. Super chat. Thank you for the super chat. Super appreciated says, um, cheers for the tips. Hopefully I can use some of this to help my channel grow. Absolutely. And, you know, in addition to what you're gonna, you know, hear today, um, I've got an entire YouTube channel full of tips that'll help you out. I've got, you know, a huge archive of these live streams. I've got a playlist called, uh, Nim and live, uh, something or other. And, um, on that particular playlist, you can just sit back and listen to this stuff in the background and you can learn a ton, um, over time, just from listening to these live streams. So, um, you know, like a lot of the things that we talk about, because it's, it's all based on the questions people ask. So because of that, sometimes we'll get into some advanced stuff. Sometimes it's just really, you know, surface level, but we, you know, we talk about everything here during the live stream. So, uh, so yeah, so thank you for the super chat and, um, and hopefully that you enjoy and get value out of the content. So next up, we got Azure Tony. Azure Tony, hey, video for bosses. What's going on? Hope you're doing great. Hybrid Steel, my man, what's going on? I, yeah, you were in here earlier already. Jamie Souza, hope you're doing great. So we got Azure Tony um, is the next question here. And again, I'm pulling these from the form that is down in the description. They have a gaming channel. Hey, how many gamers do we have here? If you're a gamer, just say me. Um, if you're a gamer, uh, the goal of the channel here is to share my love of gaming and help people find the fun in it. I feel the focus of fun has been lost and I focus on reviews and lists for accessories and games to give the most fun. Question, I had a video that did absolutely nothing in the first 24 hours and then just blew up out of nowhere after 48 hours. Um, it's a top list of NES games. My next planned video is a, is a list of Game Boy games, but am I better off putting up something like a controller headset or game review? Or should I start to put my full focus in doing top 15 videos? Um, so I would definitely try to chase it with something that the NES, uh, you know, people that responded to that video would be likely to enjoy. So if you did a top um, NES uh, list of the top NES games, I would start getting granular a little bit and see if that helps. So before you switch over to Game Boy, if you're going to do Game Boy next, then, you know, then you, you're the one that makes that call. But um, one thing that I would think about is I would think, okay, if I did NES games, then maybe I can start breaking it down granular. Like, okay, these are the best racing games. These are the best, you know, first person games. These are the best, you know, and just kind of break things down that way. The best, you know, fantasy games, best adventure games, that kind of stuff. Um, so that you can see if you can create, you know, some type of pattern and then essentially turn that into a series of some kind and or a theme of some kind. And then if so, once you burn through, you know, the options there, then hop over to Game Boy, rinse and repeat, then hop over to, you know, the next system and the next system. And then, you know, occasionally, you know, do the NES again as you, you know, come up with, uh, you know, come up with different ideas for it. But following themes like that is a, uh, is a, is a really good idea. And the, the thing that you want to think about too is like, you know, cause I play PlayStation. If I were to see that um, about a PlayStation and then it was, and then the next video was recommended to me and it was Game Boy content, I probably wouldn't click on it right? Because I don't have a Game Boy. So because of that, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to think about, okay, if I'm building a channel as a destination for people, then in that particular case, how can I make as much of this content as possible or all of it targeted towards a very specific, you know, a very specific type of viewer that's interested in very specific things. Next up, Studio Nova TV. Studio Nova TV. Um, they do manga voiceover and anime reviews the goal of the channel is to build an audience and possibly do youtube professionally the question is i've heard a lot about persons have been getting access to a b testing recently sadly i'm not one of them do you have access and if so can you show us what it looks like and how it functions yeah let's do it so um for those of you that um that do not have the a b testing feature this is what is coming your way 
So let, give me just a second here and I will get it, um, I'll get it up and then you can check it out while I'm doing this. I'll give you something to listen to. Getting my fix in my kitchen, but look at the logo, the plug for the show. Whoa. It don't matter the flavor, I'm gonna get haters. A cup of a pot of the gold, I just need you to hold for a little bit longer. This song ain't a joke, it's a banger, you know where you don't. You will hang or you won't, but this thing isn't stopping till it's at the top. And I go back upstairs, man, I hope I don't drop it, I know that it's hot. It might seem one's enough, but apparently not. Take a cinnamon shot, mix it up on the spot. Give it a try, you might like it a lot. Need to hit the coffee maker, get another cup. Fiendin' for caffeine, I need it in my mug. I need to hit the coffee maker, get another cup. Fiendin' for caffeine, I need it in my mug. I need to hit the coffee maker, get another cup. Fiendin' for caffeine, I need it in my mug. Mugs up here, put your cups up here, put your tumblers up here. Now drink it, drink it, cheer, put your cups up here, put your mugs up here, put your tumblers up here. Now drink it, drink it, drink it. So when it comes to the A-B testing tool, here is what we've got. So what you do is right here, um, if you look at this area on the screen right down here, so you can see it right here, okay? So basically it's in the same exact spot for your thumbnails um, where you would normally do it. Let me see if I can zoom in on this at all. Hold on. Um... There we go. Oh, nope, that didn't work. All right, so we're not going to do that. Okay, so once we click into this, we can hit view test report. So basically, when you're doing the test, you get the option to where you can, uh, you know, upload the file, you can, you know, do the test, or you can upload it individually. And then you can see here, it prioritizes based on watch time. I'm looking here to make sure that you guys can, uh, can see that. Yeah, you can. So basically, right here, you can see that this one here was more clear. So this one out of this particular test had 37.7% of the watch time share compared to the other ones. So basically I uploaded this one right here with the YouTube logo in it here to see if that one would you know, be the winner just to grab their attention and then be a little bit more specific there. For this particular one, I said, hey, let's turn the whole middle into a YouTube thumbnail because, you know, the thing that I'm always telling you is that, you know, we got to grab attention, right? So the whole thing we're trying to do here is grab attention. So if we're grabbing attention, then a big right, bright red YouTube logo right in the center is probably going to do it. Um, and then I put the pro and the new YouTuber at the bottom, right? So the new YouTuber is to help, you know, new YouTubers identify that. And then here I did the typical thing where I just have my face and then some text over here. So, um, so there's that one. And then uh, when it comes to these, can you see this one? No, you cannot. Let me share a different window. And then um, other things that you can do here also is you can test just like little detailed stuff, right? Like um, when I first published this video, let me get it on the stage here. There we go. Um, all I did here was I just tested two and then I'll be updating this one with a test of three other ones in the future. So basically this one has 50% of the watch time shares. So they're pretty similar. I was just looking to see if simplicity would win over the 2023 and the 2024 thing. But this one right here, um, the 20, 
23 and 2024 was the winner. So what I'll end up doing with this, we still got nine days on here. So it's not the absolute winner. It's just currently the winner right now. But basically when uh, this test is complete, then this will be on YouTube long enough to where I'll go in and then I'll, I'll add two more to it based on the winner of here. So I'll test the winner against two more for more cold audiences. Because right now, this particular test is going out to people that are, you know, already engaged with the channel, that are the most likely to enjoy the content, all that good stuff. So it can kind of skew the results a little bit at the beginning. So uh, because of that, the best practice here is you want to have your, uh, you want to have your thumbnails that you put out first. And then once your video kind of settles in, so to speak, then you want to run another test and see if, you know, see if you can uh, make a difference uh, or not with that additional test. So great question there, Studio Nova. So next question that we have on our list here is, yeah, it's slowly, yeah, this is slowly getting rolled out um, to content creators. So by the end of this year, everybody's going to have it. But right now, this is slowly rolling out to, slowly rolling out to everybody. Pixie Dust Traveler, what's going on? Welcome back. Hope you're doing great. So next up, um, we've got Grazy Fallout World. The type of channel is a gaming channel. The goal of the channel is because I show off a certain game. The question is, I upload my shorts from PC to Google Drive download um, from my mobile and then upload it to my channel. Do I miss something? Why can't I upload a short directly from my PC? Technically, you can. Um, you just don't upload it directly into the short shelf. You just upload it, you know, as a short video. But workflow-wise, um, I would definitely um, just do it on your phone. I know it's a pain, but right now I would do it on your phone and then you can just, just upload them there and then you can go back into uh, your studio, how you're currently doing it. You can go into your uh, studio and do it that way. I know that they have, uh, you know, recently added the ability to upload your videos directly inside of the Creator Studio app on YouTube. I'm hoping that as part of that process, um, you know, because they're doing that on mobile, I hope they're going to mirror that on desktop to where they kind of make it to where it's like, oh, hey, now that you can upload longer form videos in the st Creator Studio on your phone, you can also do it in reverse is kind of what I'm hoping for, for the uh, desktop computers. Next on the list. <clears throat> yeah, so for the thumbnail testing, Ghost Brandish, not everybody has it yet. This is something that they are slowly rolling out uh, across the platform. So uh, let's see here. So we got that one covered. So we're on number 14 now. If you're just joining us, I'm answering the questions from the form that is down in the description. It's free to put your questions down there, um, but you need to be on YouTube if you're watching this somewhere else. Come over to YouTube, look down in the uh, description. You're gonna see a link to the form. It's free. Just put your question in there and um, I answer them in the order that they are received. I should get through uh, all the questions that I currently have right now. So if you do have a question, you should get it in there now so that we can you know, try to get to it here on the stream today. So next up, we got EduTake. EduTake, they do educational content. The goal of the channel says, I want to let, let people know the broader workings of the U.S. Education, education system through news and movies. Question, is it true that you need to publish about 20 videos for YouTube to know your audience? Uh, no. Um, I have five videos and 1,300 subs. The growth has been due to people with large following sharing my videos in their community tab. So... Um, you can you can have one video and if there's enough viewership on that one video then youtube will understand like okay these people are responding to that video and then when you publish another video if it's intended for the same audience youtube's going to recommend it to some of those people that interacted with that video and then if those people enjoy it as well then it's going to you know keep going out to more people like them the problem happens if you especially like in your case because you're having bigger youtubers share your content out like friends of yours so here's the problem is let's say because you do educational content let's say you have a friend that's a gamer and you might already have this worked out i'm just letting everybody know you know just so you know um and possibly you if you are you know dealing with this but you know you might have a friend that's a gamer you might have a friend that has a cooking channel you might have another friend that has an entertainment channel and another friend that has an education channel if all those friends share out your video content and those people come in and they you know are interacting with the video because all those people said to then in that particular case when you publish your next video it might go out to to people that aren't necessarily the right fit for that content because it's been shared with people that are not the perfect fit for the content. So because of that, you have to be really mindful, especially when you're getting started for leveraging, you know, friends in, in you know, 
that are on YouTube already to kind of help jumpstart your channel. But if the alignment is perfect to where it's like, hey, the people that are watching this channel are a perfect fit for this channel. In that case, it's a fantastic way to just start teaching YouTube really fast. Like, hey, this, you know, this uh, is a is, is, is the right audience for this channel. But YouTube's going to, you know, figure it out anyway. But that's kind of like a like a like a like a fast way, so to speak, to just, you know, seed YouTube with the right viewers. <laughs> YouTube search is the same thing. So when it comes to YouTube search, you can do you can do the same approach. So with YouTube search, if you know, like your first videos are videos that are search targeted, then in that case, you're, you are going to get recommendation traffic. But if people are finding those videos through YouTube search, because they're looking for content like yours, then in that particular case, like those people are the perfect fit for what it is that you're doing. And then that can also just kind of help, you know, teach the system what's going on, but you don't have to make 20 or 30 or 50 or, you know, anything like that videos. Um, the system can figure it out, you know, relatively fast because it tests against people. And if you have one video that does well, then that will end up being, you know, the, the, you know, the, the people that start getting tested against, and then it'll figure it out from there. So the next question that we have is from Crispy Skates. They do roller skating, um, art dance tutorials, and I make music shorts for my subs. Love it. The goal of the channel says I love a creative outlet and I want to be full time. Question, would starting a podcast where I interview other YouTubers, artists, skaters help me tie all this together? It could. Um, what you want to think about is you want to think about, okay, for the people that are interacting with your content, um, would those people enjoy a podcast? A really great way to figure this out is hop into your community feed and ask, hey, if I started a podcast, would this be something that you would listen to? Also, before you even ask that question, the very first thing, the you, you, very first poll that you should put in your community feed, do you listen to podcasts? And then if they say yes, then the next thing is, if I do a podcast where I interview other YouTube skaters, would this be something you'd, you'd be interested in? But if you are targeting roller skaters and you are, you know, your video content's about roller skates, your uh, short content's about roller skates, your music videos are about roller skates, and you start podcasting, talking to other roller skaters, great fit, right? Great fit. Next up, we've got next up. Next question. We got Art with Mazzy is the next one on the list here. Uh, they are getting ready to start their channel. Um, the type of channel is Art for Kids. They're a faceless content creator. The goal of the channel is to teach and inspire kids to do all kinds of art and use their imagination. Question is, what are ways to attract more viewers or subscribers without trying to be like other YouTubers? Like, oh, it's just another one of these channels. So, um, yeah, you, one of the best ways to do that is not being faceless because you as the creator are, you know, the, 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 the differentiating factor there. Um, but if you are like, Hey, I'm going to be faceless <laughs> then in that particular case, um, just going and researching everybody else in the space that's making similar content and looking for things that they all do in a similar way and trying to think, okay, what can I do that is going to be different from them? Um, it's just basic, you know, market research. So basically you go and you look at, you know, all those different channels and you look for similarities that seem to be working for everybody so that you can kind of follow along there because they've all figured it out, um, for the ones that are doing well. And then from there, you want to say, okay, if all of them are doing this, then, you know, is there a way that I can, you know, if all of them are making really long videos, then, you know, is there a way that I can give, you know, shorter videos, which with kids content, I'd try to go long so they can just sit there and watch it because a lot of parents will just give their kids like an iPad or whatever and just let them sit there and, and consume it. But basically, um, what you want to do is you want to yeah, try to try to figure out um, exactly, you know, what you can do different. So just to give you an example. So when I first started my channel, um, a couple of things that I did to stand out is one, everybody um, in the YouTube help space at that time, um, people were giving a lot of really great information, but they're keeping everything like really surface level and not necessarily giving like step by step stuff. Because you know, a lot of people were like, you know, coaches and things like that. So they were trying to make it to where like, hey, I'm going to give tons of great free information, but I'm just going to not give too much because, you know, I want people to hire me. And when I came in, I was like, hey, um, I'm going to just, you know, not when I came in, but once I, you know, figured out what to do, um, I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, give people, you know, exactly what it is that I'm doing that's working. Um, and I'm going to show them step by step how to do stuff. And I'm going to basically just share everything freely that I know. And that was one thing that helped me stand out. Number two is a lot of the ch education channels at that time like I said, because, you know, they're all coaches and stuff. They're all professionals. Me, I'm a creative. So because of that, I'm like, okay, how can I, how can I, uh, you know, do this in a way to where I'm a creator 
helping creators. And that's where I, you know, I, I spent time putting my background together and trying to make my videos pop and trying to make them really engaging. I started using a different presentation style. So at that time, you know, everybody's doing kind of like what I'm doing now. Um, but basically I started doing a presentation style to where I would like jump from this side of the camera and then over to this side of the camera and then jump in the middle. And, you know, I was doing, you know, things like that and interacting with the camera in like a really fun and engaging way. I should do another one of those videos sometime. Those are super fun to make. But anyway, um, but you know, those are things that I did to stand out. Now keep in mind, I'm on camera, so it's a little bit different. I can do those things. But um, in your case, you just want to look for things like that. Like, okay, what's the standard right now? And then what can I do? And it might be something to where it's like, hey, if everybody's showing this kind of art, then maybe I can, you know, show art that's kind of like this, that would still be interesting to kids, but it would be something that maybe is educational plus art, or science plus art, or uh, entertainment plus art, or, you know, something, something along those lines. But mixing stuff up, which is why I started walking down that road, mixing stuff up, you know, mixing genres together is also, you know, a really good way to make something that stands out. Um, let's see here. Next up on the list here, we got Mr. Waves himself reacts. They do entertainment and musical reaction channel, the gold channels to entertain people and make people's days and lives better through the love of my music across the world, as well as enjoyment of music and artists like myself, which will lead to my supporting my family and more in the future. Question. I've been on YouTube since late 2019 with 5,000 uh, subscribers. My question is, why is it that some of my videos I post only receive two or three views? when previous videos have received 500 or 2,000 views, or as of recently, 20,000 on one video. I've also had great growth in subscribers lately, which is weird. The last two videos I posted received only two to five views. Why is this? And how can I push to, re, uh, to receive more views even after sharing on multiple platforms and more? First, try to not share on multiple platforms. Um, the reason for this is because when you are sharing on those platforms, you might be sharing your content in front of the wrong people. Two, um, the next thing that could be happening is if you are making shorts content, um, it's, it, it's interesting to me that you're only getting like two to five views, um, on a video, even with shorts, like you should be getting more than that. Um, what I would do is I would actually go and look at the impressions that you're getting on the, on the videos. So if you're making long, I, I got to look at your channel, so I'm, I'm not going to pull it up, but I, I just need just a smidge more, uh, just a little bit more context here. So when it comes to. When it comes to long form content, one of the things that you can do there is you can go and you can say, okay, let me check the impressions that I'm getting on this. Yeah, it's long form, I see it. Yeah, it's long form content that you're having this problem. So yeah, so first go and look at the impressions that you're getting on the videos. Um, if you're getting impressions, that tells you that YouTube is showing the content to people, but maybe you're just having trouble getting them to click. And that trouble getting them to click could be that the topic isn't something that is you know, a, a wide, uh, you know, wide interest thing or a broad interest thing. Um, it could be that, you know, whatever it is that you have in the thumbnail, your thumbnail and title combination, um, that those things are just not, you know, people just aren't responding to it. So step number one is I would definitely go and look and just confirm that YouTube is giving you impressions on these videos. How you find this is you go into your YouTube analytics, <clears throat> excuse me, you go into your YouTube analytics, or you go into your YouTube creator studio, then you click into content, then you click into the videos in question, and then you look at the analytics, and then you go and you look at impressions in analytics. If you see more than five, that means that YouTube is showing your content to people that you are just having some trouble getting them to click. Um, the next thing you wanna do is you wanna go and look and see where YouTube is showing your content. So then you wanna click on your traffic sources report. First, you click on advanced mode, and then, in advanced mode, go look at your traffic sources, and in there, you're going to see um, where you're getting impressions on YouTube. And an impression, for those of you that are new, is where YouTube shows your content to somebody on a platform. That's what impressions mean in your YouTube analytics. So uh, you wanna look at that first. And if YouTube is not giving you impressions on your videos, at Team YouTube on, on Twitter, and let them know, hey, for whatever reason, you know, I'm not getting any impressions on my videos. But if you are getting impressions, then YouTube is showing your content to people, you're just having trouble getting people to click. Um, or once they do click, people are just abandoning the video really quick. So then YouTube is like, hey, w when people are coming into this, they're just not responding to it. So this is also where it's really important to make sure that like the hooks of your videos are good and all of those things. But it looks like, you know, just at a, at a quick glance here, like it looks like what you're doing is okay. Um, so I would definitely just go into your stats and try to figure out, you know, what's going on there in terms of, you know, the impressions that you are or are not getting. Um, let's see here. 
Next up on the list. Oops. Sorry. Wrong button. It's not that kind of party. <laughs> if you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. Next up, we got Jess Book Girl TV. Jess Book Girl TV uploads when she has time. The type of channel is they talk about books. The goal of the channel is talking about books. And the question is, will YouTube have a direct link to Discord or Instagram one day? So what you can do if you do want, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go back one. So really quick here, um, Mr. Waves himself reacts. Um, Let's see here. I'm just going to drop it. Well, here. I'll do it this way. So YouTube's creator liaison is in here right now. And um, he's actually going to go over and check out your channel. Yeah, so here is the channel name. Oh, he just dropped a super chat there too. Uh, so you can find him that way also. But I just dropped it in, in there, uh, Renee. And thank you for that. I appreciate it. So yeah, he's going he's gonna to take a look at your, uh, look at your channel. He works at he works at uh, YouTube. He's YouTube's he's YouTube's glue <laughs> between liaison between uh, between you know the uh, between you know the YouTube company and content creators. He's he's our representative and their representative in our direction. <laughs> uh, next up on our list here, we got uh, Jess Book. So um, she says, will YouTube have a direct link to Discord or Instagram one day? So what you can do, um, and I'm just going to pull up uh, Mr. Uh, Waves himself reacts uh, uh, right here. Let me just make sure everything's family friendly and all that real quick. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to use his channel right here just because I have it up on my screen and just show you something really quick. So when it comes to, when it comes to the links, the direct links, um, one of the things that you can do is... If you look right here, you can see how he has his Instagram linked right here. So YouTube now has a functionality called creator links. We've always been able to add, you know, links up here, but now they're showing up here. So they're more accessible on mobile devices. So what you can do, Jess, is if I click here into the two more links, you can see that I can see the places that he links out to here. So we have his Instagram, we have his Twitter account, and then we have this online store. So what you can do is if you have a Discord, you can add it there. If you have an Instagram, you can add it there. Um, and then that way, anybody that interacts with your channel can find it here through your creator links. If you are publishing long form content, then you also have your video descriptions as well, where you can also, uh, where you can also add uh, you know, links to whatever you know, other things that you're trying to spread awareness about. Um, next up on our list here, we've got Off the Shelf Rides. They upload one time per week or more. They've been on YouTube for a year or more. The type of channel is automotive. The goal of the channel is 10,000 subs by the end of 2024. And the question is, on my channel content page, I had an icon show up the other day. Each video says not tested, which looks like a button, but it disappears when you try to click on it. Do you have any idea what this is? I use TubeBuddy Legend and basic vidIQ plugins. Could it be something that they are doing? Yeah, it is possible. Um, I actually had this pop up as well. I think it's a TubeBuddy thing. Um, I because I saw it and I don't have vidIQ in, so uh, so I'm pretty confident it's either a TubeBuddy thing or a YouTube thing. But um, but I don't think that it's a I don't think it's a YouTube thing. And and just for clarity here, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it right now. So if I go to my uh, if I go to my page here, I can see it. I can see it right here. So here I'll just I'll just show you. So um, for everybody that's here. If you end up seeing this, boom, if you end up seeing this right here, that thing, that's what, that's what uh, they're talking about. So yeah, so I think it's a TubeBuddy thing. It's either a TubeBuddy thing or a YouTube thing. Um, I saw that as well, but I haven't looked into it yet. Um, traveling with Russell, what's going on? Hope that you are doing great. Says, what do you feel about their channel name? Is it too long? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it's more complicated than it is long, um, just because you know of of how you know how it's uh, you know like when you're writing it all out and everything. I think it's a little bit complicated. But you know, when it comes to channel names, it's hard. You know, finding like a good unique channel name. But you know, if they could find two. Oh, uh, so Renee says it is a two buddy bug. They posted about it on Twitter yesterday and says that they're fixing it. Okay, so we got that clarity there as well. Love it. Yeah, I didn't see that uh, tweet. Thank you. Um, let's see here, but yeah, so, uh, next question that we have, so we got off the shelf rides, we got that. Okay. So that's covered. 
Next, we've got John Willis. John Willis does cameras, filmmaking, studio tech, and productivity content. The goal of the channel is to help aspiring creators elevate their content and transform their home setup. The question is, I want to be able to quit my job, quit my job, and go full-time as a creator. I'm posting at least twice a week, creating a product and growing an email list. My question is, do you think it's a realistic goal for an aspiring creator to go full-time on YouTube within six months to a year if they put the work in? So when it comes to YouTube um, and going full-time, there's a lot of different things that you have to think about. So one of those things is like, while you're working on your YouTube channel, do you have a nice amount of money saved up that you can lean on, right? Do you have money that you can put aside and say, okay, this is going to be my live money while I am, you know, building up my YouTube stuff, right? Two is how much money do you currently have coming into your YouTube channel? Um, with what it is that you're talking about, I can tell you into the future, you know, people are still going to need that information. So you're good there um, in terms of, you know, what you're getting into. But I would also make sure that you are generating some type of income because there's a difference between putting in the work and understanding what it is that you're doing and being able to recognize when things are good or not and all of that. So there's a lot of people that put in the work, but because they've been putting in the work, they haven't necessarily gotten things to the point yet to where what they're publishing is competitive to the platform to, or for the platform to where it's bringing in enough viewership to where they can go full time with it, right? So because of that, I would I I would do what I did, which is go for your, keep doing your regular job until you can get YouTube to the point to where it is a sustainable income for you and then go all in. So then that way, as soon as you cut off your full-time job, not only do you have the money that you've put aside that you've been saving up while YouTube has been paying you out and affiliates have been paying you out and whatever products that you create has been paying you out, but not only do you have that extra money, but you also have you know a, a steady monthly income coming in. Now, a couple other things to think about. If you're going full-time, there's a whole other element to this because uh, you can make large amounts of money on YouTube and you can make stable money on YouTube, but it's very difficult to make very stable money and large amounts of stable money just from ads alone um, if you're not making super broad audience content. So with what it is that you are doing specifically with cameras, filmmaking, studio tech, and productivity, I would put together, you know, some type of personal products that you can sell around the productivity side, maybe Notion stuff and, you know, things like that. Um, I would be promoting things as an affiliate for cameras, filmmaking, and studio tech. I would also, because if you have people that are interested in cameras, filmmaking, and studio tech, they're probably making videos for the internet. So because of that, I would also promote TubeBuddy as an affiliate. I would promote TubeSpanner as an affiliate. I would promote um, Opus Clip as an affiliate. I'd promote StreamYard as an affiliate. I would promote uh, Uscreen as an affiliate. I would promote Camtate. Like I would promote everything um, as an affiliate. Sign up for Adobe's affiliate program and basically start diversifying all of the different ways that you're making money with a bunch of different products. And the reason that you want to do it with a bunch of different products is because tomorrow Adobe could say, you know what, we're going to shut down our affiliate program. Sorry. And then there's nothing that you can do about it. This happens like people do this and there's nothing that you can do about it. Um, so because of that, you don't want to just go all in on one thing. You want to make sure that you're promoting a bunch of different things. Um, and then when you do that, you start creating all of these different levels of security. And right now you're already building an email list. So you can also do some marketing through your email list as well. You can use that to pull people back into your YouTube channel. But the idea I'm trying to express is if you're going to go full time, you need a clear runway, right? In terms of like, okay, this is how much I'm going to need. I'm putting some money aside. I'm also going to put my YouTube money aside. I'm also going to have a diversified income from all these different ways that I can make money for my YouTube channel. I'm going to get all of them to a position to where I'm bringing in like a decent amount of money to where it would make sense to quit my job. And then I'm still going to just stockpile some money for a while. And then I'm going to go all in right? Because it's a big risk, right? Especially if you have, you know, like bills and things like that. It, it is a big risk. But if you can do it, then it's a it's a you know, the, the reward is pretty awesome, too. So um, uh, just keep in mind that when you are a content creator, that you are starting a business. And since you are starting a business, there's a whole other additional things that you got to worry about. So like, for example, if, because you're suddenly self employed, you also if you're in the US, you have self employment taxes, you got to pay now, 
right? So you have like things like that. You got to start taking care of your own healthcare now. You got to start looking after your own investments and things like that. So it, it creates like a whole other, you know, additional amount of things that you got to think about. So if you're wanting to go full time, you got to make sure that you're doing all of those things. And we have Diane Hedge right here says, trust me, never quit your day job for YouTube unless you're Mr. Beast. I strongly disagree. I've been a full time. I've been a content creator for a little over nine years. I've been full time for seven and like everything, like everything's paid off, um, no debt or anything like that. Um, and like everything is, is amazing. So, you know, like I support creators that do want to go full time and that do want to be, you know, a, a professional content creator, um, uh, because I do it. And I have a lot of YouTube friends that are also full time and been full time for a very long time. And the lifestyle that you can create for yourself um, is pretty incredible, not just on the financial side, but also like you get to control your day. You can control when you work like some kind. I have a friend of mine. He'll batch record like, uh, you know, like 20 videos over the course of a couple of days or whatever. And then he won't work for a couple of months. So basically he'll do those, hand them off to editors, and then he has somebody that will, you know, um, put them up onto YouTube. And then basically all he does is he will go in and confirm things, and then he will, you know, schedule all the videos for publishing. And then he'll just like walk away and go take vacations and just go like hang out at home or go just like go to the gym every day and play football or play games or like whatever he wants to do. So, you know, the lifestyle is great, but you have to approach it like it's a business. You have to, because if you don't, then, uh, then it'll be a very short lived thing. So us plus dad is our, uh, is our next channel. Ty's hot mess history. What's going on? I hope you're doing great. So yeah, Ty's hot, hot mess history says that, uh, she was able to quit construct a construction project, uh, project management to do YouTube full time. Yeah. Doctors, you know, there's doctors on YouTube that quit being a doctor so that they can do YouTube. There's lawyers that quit being a lawyer so that they can do YouTube. Like there's, there's tons of opportunity here. You just have to be able to see it and you have to have the, the business, you know, sense to be able to navigate the whole thing and be able to, you know, manage it all properly, but it's hard, but any endeavor that you're going to take on yourself, if you, if any entrepreneurial endeavor that you're going to take on yourself, is difficult and it comes with tons of pressure. It doesn't matter if it's YouTube or if you're starting a shop somewhere selling donuts or if you are creating some type of online thing or whatever, um, it's all hard. That's why most people, they go and they clock in somewhere and they get a paycheck and they let somebody else do all the thinking and they let somebody else do all of the management of all the things that need to be done because it's a lot of work. Like for, you know, if you have a regular job and, and I'm gonna get back to the questions right here in a second, but if you have a regular job, at five o'clock or whatever, you can just shut off and walk away, right? In terms of your brain, you can just go and focus on whatever. But if you are doing things yourself, sometimes, um, like for me anyway, um, like I'm always thinking about it, right? It's all, I'm always thinking about it. I'm thinking of what I can do. I'm thinking about, you know, like, okay, um, is there something that I can make? Is there something that I can work on? Um, is there better videos that I can make? Is there, you know, like I'm always thinking of, you know, those things, so. Okay, next up, us plus dad. Um, the joke is really quick back to that. The joke is that, you know, for an entrepreneurial joke here is that, you know, people leave their 40 hour job looking for freedom so that they can work 60 to 80 hours for themselves. <laughs> right. But, you know, YouTube, you know, you can turn it into a lifestyle business to where, you know, you, you work, you know, just a little bit. And as long as you're doing the thing, then, you know, you can do it or you can work it like a real job to where you're like, hey, I'm putting in at least, you know, 40 hours. And, uh, uh, and, you know, with that time, I'm going to, I'm going to blow this thing out of the water. So next up, we got us plus dad. They've been on YouTube for less than a year. They do Roblox role play content. They have the goal of the channel is to create an interactive Roblox community. And speaking of community, we have a link to our members only discord down in the description. So if you are a discord user, make sure you check that out. But the question is, is there a place to get gifts and use videos without getting copyright? Thanks for all you do. Um, there are places where you can like get clips of videos and things like that, but you still have copyright to deal with. So there's a misconception or a myth that you have, uh, you know, you can use a video as long as it's under a certain length or whatever, but that's not the case. Um, so, you know, if you're using something, you have to use it in the right way to not have a risk involved. So basically when it comes to using copyrighted material, you see all over the place, all kinds of YouTubers, they'll use like movie clips and things like that to emphasize a joke that they're telling or something like that, which is not fair use. And currently the systems can't really detect 
protect that as much because they'll use it, you know, like such a short amount of it. But the day that changes and with, you know, AI getting smarter and smarter and all these different systems getting smarter, the day that changes there and mark my words on this, you can quote this. It's going to happen eventually. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. The day that changes, there's going to be an avalanche of YouTube channels that are in tons of hot water that are just freaking out because they don't know what to do because their channels are getting taken down from, from having like, you know, a hundred videos where they do that kind of stuff to where they're going to be fighting uh, copyright problems. So just, just wait and see that day will come. So uh, build with Mooney um, is our next question. Um, the type of channel is woodworking. The goal of the channel is to share and teach. And the question is, I'm starting to see the new YouTube features like the CTR note that shows now um, that reads like this. This video is reaching a wider audience. This video is reaching a wider audience in YouTube, leading to a lower click-through rate than usual. Wider audiences are often less likely to choose to watch, but the lower CTR is not hurting this video's count. Nick, this felt like a cheat code when I first saw this. It made me warm and fuzzy. What do you think? Yeah, so YouTube's been putting those messages in the Creator Studio for quite some time now. So um, when you see those messages, this is a great example of YouTube doing an excellent job of trying to inform creators on why their videos do and do not do well. And uh, other parts of this language too, like when you see this kind of stuff for everybody here, when you see this kind of stuff in your dashboard, look at it and, and think about it like, okay, what does this actually mean, right? So for example, this part right here where it says, um, uh, this video is reaching a wider audience on YouTube leading to a lower click through rate than usual, okay? So just, I would say probably 20 minutes ago, I was talking about how when you get more impressions, how it can push your metrics down. This is, that's YouTube's version of telling you the same exact thing, just using different words, right? So basically their way is probably a little more user friendly, but basically, you know, this video is reaching a wider audience on YouTube, leading to a lower click-through rate than usual. Wider audiences are often less likely to choose to watch, but the lower click-through rate is not hurting this video's count, right? So, uh, so yeah, those types of things are valuable and high five and fist bump to YouTube for, you know, doing that. Like I, I think like, Back in the day, right? Because I've been on YouTube now for over nine years. So back in the day, we didn't have like a quick view analytics. Like we didn't, you know, it wasn't like that, right? Um, like it was kind of a quick view, but like we didn't have all the stuff that's in there now. Like uh, uh, in order to like really know pretty much anything on your channel, you had to go into advanced mode and you had to go in there and like, you know, figure stuff out. But now they're making it so easy to where you can just look at at the quick view analytics and you can start to get, you know, like a, like a pretty good idea of what's going on in your channel. And they also have all these messages in there, like the one that we were just talking about. And a lot of the features um, inside of your YouTube channel, if you look, there's going to be like little circles with eye icons on them or question mark icons. If you hover over those, those even give you additional information about the features. So, uh, so they're doing a really great job on, you know, making it easy for, for everybody to, uh, to understand, you know, what's going on with their channel so we can make better content to serve the viewers of YouTube. So Beneath Steel Rain 247 is the next channel here. They have a gaming channel. The goal of the channel is to create informational videos about games to enhance the gaming experience of players and demonstrate methods to achieve things in the game. The question is, I've recently created a long form video that is 37 minutes long. Historically, most of my videos average between three to eight minutes and do well for the current state of my channel. Although I have a chapter selection for the long form video, would you suggest cropping this long form video down into smaller videos to get back what my viewers seem to like to watch three to eight minute videos? Try it. So one of the things as a content creator that is super important for all of us to do is to experiment on a regular basis. When you're experimenting on a regular basis, what you're doing is you're giving yourself opportunities to see things that might not have been seen or to serve your viewers in ways to where you might have thought, I don't know if they're going to like this or not. And then you do it and then they like that more than anything else that you do. Right. So because of that, it's important to experiment. So if you have a 37 minute long video, if you, if you made that video for the sake of publishing it as a 37 minute video, publish it. See how people respond to it. They might love it. They might want nothing but 37 or 30 minute plus videos from you. Um, that happens to people. So because of that, um, I would experiment with it and see what they, you know, see if they like it. And depending on the response there, you can take out parts of it, add like a, a different intro or something like that. And you can still condense, you know, shorter versions of it, but you just want to mix it up a little bit, right? Like add a different intro or something to where it makes more sense. Because if you just cut things out 
and then you try to package them up, you're going to be starting it in weird places and things like that. But if you're like, okay, I'm going to take this part of it and turn it into a three to eight minute video, but I'm also going to add like a new intro to it so that I can kind of lead into what it is. So as people click on it and they come into the video, it makes more sense instead of just starting in the middle of something. Next on the list, and hey, if you're just joining us, we're talking about all things related to YouTube. So if you have a YouTube channel, you're in the right place. Um, there's a form down in the description of the stream right now where you can put your questions in there and get them answered for free here um, on the stream today. Thanks to our sponsors, TubeBuddy, StreamYard, and the other sponsors of the channel as well. Um, so if you have a question, make sure that you get it down in the uh, form that is in the description. So, uh, and thanks for hanging out in the stream. Glad that you're here. So the channel name here is The New Enlightenment with Ashley. Um, they do bi-weekly content. The type of channel is a video essay. The goal of the channel is exploring topics and education. The question is, should I avoid putting new videos into old playlists if my old videos don't get much traction, or is it fine to just cluster by topic regardless of quality? Should I delete older, poorly performing videos? So no, I wouldn't delete videos unless they're for a different audience. So like, for example, let's say that you used to do vlog content um, to where it was just like you running around doing a bunch of stuff, but now you do something that's very specific and targeted for an audience that isn't, you know, that that vlog content doesn't match. That's where you'd want to consider, you know, kind of unlisting some stuff. But when it comes to uh, the content itself, even if it's bad quality, um, if it's still targeted towards that same audience, I would leave it up. However, um, when it comes to your playlist, keep in mind that you can add videos to multiple playlists on your YouTube channel. So because of that, um, go ahead and add them to, you know, the playlist of the older videos. If you need to do that categorically based on where you're putting those playlists or how you're linking to those playlists, but you can also add those videos to a playlist of just more recent content on the same topic as well. And then you can just link into those also. So it's your call, um, on that particular thing. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to, uh, you know, think about playlists instead of like, Hey, every playlist or every video just goes into one playlist. You want to think about it through the lens of like, okay, what makes sense for this playlist based on how I'm using it? Am I linking to it from pinned comments? Am I linking to it from end screens? If so, then maybe I just need to put a couple of videos in there. If I'm linking to it from my channel page where people can just go and sort through everything, then in that case, I'm going to, you know, fill it up with a bunch of videos on that particular topic. Um, if I am just having it, you know, as a playlist is going to live on my playlist page, then in that particular case, you know, I'll just let it live there with a bunch of videos in it too. So just thinking about it in terms of how you're going to use it and how you want your viewers to, uh, to, you know, to consume the content. Brad, Magic Flying Potato. What's going on, dude? Hope that you are doing great. So next up, we've got JB Kings Gaming in the house. Says they do gaming content. The goal of the channel is to entertain and provide my viewers with the best class setup for weapons of Warzone. The question is, I post both long and short form videos and I gain most of my subs from shorts. Should I post more shorts with long videos until I reach a thousand subscribers so my long videos get more views because I average 200 views for a long form video? So if your goal is, hey, I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers as quickly as I possibly can and I'm also publishing shorts, I'm publishing long form content and people are subscribing the most from my shorts, keep doing it. While you're doing that, um, keep working on your long form videos, pay really close attention to how people are responding to your long form videos, make sure you're looking in your audience retention reports, click through rate for those long form videos. So you can look for any things that you can improve upon. And then once you find those things to improve upon, keep tweaking those while you're also publishing shorts to, um, you know, to keep the subscribers coming in. Fortunately, YouTube is building, you know, the bridges and the bridges are kind of there, you know, in some capacity where you can link directly through to, you know, other videos and just inside of their system. Sometimes if I watch shorts, then I'll start seeing the creator on my homepage. Sometimes if I watch a creator, uh, you know, just through my homepage or my subscription feed, then I'll start, you know, seeing those creators pop up in shorts. So they, they're, they're the connections there. So now you just have to think about how you're going to be using both of the tools that you have available. Magic Flying Potato, thank you for your support for 32 months. Says, uh, doing well, Nick. Looking forward to YouTube in 2024. Thanks for all of your help and knowledge. Thank you, my man. Hope that you're doing great. Button, hit the like button if you're having fun comment type something if you're laying back leaning and engage just take a second to smash the whole page Next, we've got Matt Cave Gaming. Matt Cave Gaming uploads one time, uh, one week, one time per week or more. 
The type of channel is gaming, retro, remasters, and remakes. Um, the goal of the channel says I'm a lifelong gamer since I was one years old. It's like, that's serious. I mean, I don't know how old you are now, but I mean, that's, that's serious. Gaming at one. Yeah. Serious, like serious, serious. <laughs> Says, I love sharing my experiences with my audiences, um, hoping to make this channel a true source of income in the near future. The question is, chapters in the timeline bar vanish from my videos and live replays, and eventually they come back sometime later. The chapter links continue to work. Any idea what could be causing this? Um, so the only thing that I could think of would be like where it is that you're viewing it from. Like, uh, you know, but really if you're viewing it in the app or on a desktop computer, um, then they should be showing up. Um, if you're using an ad blocker, I don't know if that that impacts it or not, because I don't use an ad blocker. I'm a premium user. But if you're using an ad blocker, that may have some type of impact. I'm not sure. But um, uh, that's the only thing that I could really think of, you know, that would do that. Or it could just be, you know, some other, you know, like random issue. If it is something that that is recurring and you see it continuing to happen, I would reach out to uh, Team YouTube on Twitter, just at them, let them know the problem that you're having and see if somebody over there can look into it to try to get you sorted. Next up, we've got Always Calm 25. Always Calm 25 does meditation content. The goal of the channel is to help people relax and to take care of their mental health. Um, the question is, what are your thoughts on meditation channels? I think they're great. I think they're great. Like if you're teaching people how to meditate, um, I think that that is a service that more, or I think that's a great service that you can offer. And I think, you know, it's something that more people should do because there's there's a... There's kind of like a stigma that comes with meditation that fortunately, like the productivity space has, you know, that they're, they're slowly working on that and getting more people to, uh, you know, meditate. But um, there's this stigma that comes with meditation where people think that it's all you know, like woo woo, you know, type stuff and things like that. But there's science, you know, behind it. And uh, it's a it's a very advantageous thing. And I think more people should meditate. So because of that, I think that, you know, uh, if you're helping people to meditate, I think it's great because you're, you're changing lives one viewer at a time. Traveling Blossom, Tara, nice to see you here as well. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the stream, Kevin. Welcome uh, here as well. Next up, we got Suburban Acreage. They upload one time per week or more. The type of channels, how-tos, tool reviews, and tutorials focused on home ownership and lawn care. Goal of the channel is to share information, build a community, and to make some money. Question. In your last video, there's a sound effect used at the beginning between clips that sounds like a whoosh, swoosh, or something being moved through the air quickly. I've noticed that sound on a lot of videos in my niche, and I'm wondering what on earth is it called? I'm using Final Cut Pro, and I'm searching for a similar sound effect, but I don't even know what it's called. What's the name for that style of effect? Um, it is a whoosh. <laughs> so you know it. It's a, it's a, it's a whoosh sound effect. So um, the, I got mine from Epidemic Sound. So if you go to epidemicsound.com, I've got a link to them down in the description. I think I still have a link to them down in the description. But um, but yeah, they have just tons and tons of sound effects. They also have music that you can use and all that. Uh, but yeah, the, the the sound effects over there are, yeah, they have an entire section of whooshes. So like when you click on the sound effects option, it's going to show you a grid at the top of the page. And one of them is whooshes. And I think it's the first one that you see. So when you click on that one, you go in there and you're like, holy cow, I didn't even know that I could sift through like, you know, 30 pages of, of whoosh sound effects. But yeah, they, uh, yeah, they're great. Oh, so Doug says, uh, use some whoosh sound, whooshes from Final Cut. So maybe some are built in. That's pretty cool. Didn't know that. So uh, let's see here. Next up on the list. Hey, really quick though, I'm glad that you're paying attention to those details, right? Those are the, those are the little things that make videos fun, right? Is is those little uh, those little details? But the next channel here is the Halloween episodes. They do TV recaps. The goal of the channel is community and income. The question is, what kind of affiliate link should I be focusing on for spooky '90s and 2000s TV episode recaps channel? Man, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I would definitely do like merch of some kind. I would try to come up with some clever merch that you could offer from that. Um, and then that way, you know, it'd be like your own stuff there. You can do that through Spreadshop. How that would work is you sign up for a Spreadshop account. And then through that Spreadshop account, you just need to make the designs. So you can make those designs in an app. You can make those designs, uh, you know, you can have somebody on Fiverr make them. You can make them in Canva or Photoshop, depending on, you know, your 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 skill level or what you want to do. Um, but yeah, you can do that as one option. Um, for the rest of them, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe headphones, right? For people that are watching these shows on, you know, like Apple TVs or, you know, things like that. Um, maybe, you know, linking to headphones, but just linking to them without spreading awareness isn't really enough, right? So yes, people will get on your video description and look for things, but 
you want to make sure that you're driving people down there for a reason, especially if you're trying to sell something like headphones, right? Because if you have headphones down there, then you could say, you could make it like a theme of what it is that you're doing. So it's like, hey, you know, before we get into this, let me put on my headphones, right? And then you have like headphones that you always recommend that you really enjoy. And then you always link to those down in your description. Then they become like a theme, a thematic thing that goes on with your videos, part of your ritual when you're starting your content. And then with that, then, you know, it's a way to spread awareness about it while also, you know, building that ritual into your content. So then as your regular viewers are coming into your content, they're like, oh, love it when they put on their headphones, because that means that the thing's starting or like whatever the thing is. Right. But like, uh, the idea is to, you know, try to find things like that that you can do. But yeah, for, for that type of content, um, yeah, I would think like headphones, maybe, um, if there is any like other memorabilia for these shows on Amazon and, and those types of things, letting people know that you have those links available would be something I would try. But yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I I'd, I'd definitely need to spend some more time on that. Um, just kind of trying to think of what to do there. So, um, just as a quick reminder, if you are joining us, there's a form down in the description right now where you can put your questions. Um, all of the super chat. Mike, thank you for the super sticker there. I appreciate it. Or the super chat. I appreciate it. But basically, um, there's a form that is down in the description. So if you have a question about what it is that you're doing on YouTube, some problem that you're running into or something like that, um, go ahead and put it in the form. If you get it in there now, it will get answered on the stream uh, on the stream today. So right now, I've just got a handful of more questions left. So if you do have a question, get it down there, and then uh, and then I can get you sorted. Uh, I can get you sorted here. So next up. We've got uh, Floppy Deep Dive. They do bi-weekly content. The type of channel is retro computers. The goal of the channel says I like to share my love of retro computers and games. I want to build a community and have a side gig. Question, I heard you say if you hide your channel from someone, they wouldn't know it was hidden. I did this and received an email from a viewer asking why it was so rude for hiding them. Uh, so when I hide my channel from someone, can they tell that I did it? The only way that they can tell that you did it is if they actually make the comment and then they go in on a different account and look for that comment and they see that it's not there. So the only people that are really gonna do this are probably gonna be people that are problematic anyway because they're gonna be the only ones that are looking around for how do I know if, my cha if I've been banned from a channel or how do I know if I've been shadow banned from a channel or something like that. So if you have people that are uh, you know, saying those types of things to you, they're probably pro problematic in the first place, so. Uh, or maybe not, you know, I mean, I, I shouldn't make those assumptions. Maybe they're fine. Right. But you know, they shouldn't even have noticed is what I'm getting at. So the fact that they noticed means that it's not their first rodeo and that they're checking YouTube comments to see if they're banned or not, which in my opinion, puts a big spotlight on, you know, on that user, <laughs> uh, motive music studios. They do bi-weekly content. The type of channel is music education. The goal of the channel is creative inspiration for piano teachers. And the question is, what is your favorite recommendation for boosting watch time? My view duration usually sits between 20 or 30 and 60%, but my videos are short and I'm hoping to build watch time this year. Favorite recommendation is setting up the expectation of the viewer in the right way. It's really easy as a content creator to lean on like, okay, I need to make this as compelling as possible. So because of that, I'm going to step into like clickbait territory and I'm going to just make this like super sensational so that people kind of have to click on this. When you do that and things are a little bit too much, then people can come in and they are not satisfied with the content because they're not like their expectation isn't really met. Like you set the bar up here, but what you're giving them is here, right? So because of that, the best thing you can do for retention is to excuse me, best thing you can do for retention is to make sure that you're setting up the expectation properly from the outside. Be like, hey, this is what you're gonna get. This is what you're gonna get in the video. I'm gonna try to make it compelling, but this is what you're gonna get out of this video. And when you do that, then you're going to increase the likelihood of being able to deliver on that, and then people will watch there. Um, in addition to that, cut out things that waste time. Think about the viewer. It's easy for us to focus on the things that we want out of the content, but if you focus on the viewer and you think to yourself, okay, how can I get to the viewer to what it is that they need out of this content or what they want or expect out of this content as fast as possible. When you focus on that, it's going to be beneficial for you because then again, people are gonna end up watching you know, that content and being satisfied with that content. So I would definitely do those types of things. In addition to that, make sure that you are kind of teasing things that you know can happen later in the video. 
everybody knows that when you say things like, oh, and the best thing's gonna be at the end of the video, everybody knows that when you do that, that, uh, that yeah, you know, you, you're saving things for the end, but it may or may not be the best thing, right? So everybody knows that, all the viewers of YouTube, every, everybody's caught on to that by now. So because of that, what you wanna do is, is if you're talking about something in a video, just be like, yeah, I'm gonna show you that here in a second. Right. And, and just do it that way. So it's more casual. It's more, uh, you know, authentic that way. Um, and it's just that that little nudge for the people that are getting ready to bail like, oh, they do have something cool coming up here in just a second or whatever. So I would definitely do that. Tiffany, what's going on? Hope that you are doing great. Nice to see you in here on stage podcast on stage VP podcast. Hope that you are doing great says are adding tags worth it. And what do they do? Um, add tags to your videos until YouTube removes that box. So this is something you can use TubeBuddy for. With TubeBuddy, when you upload a video, it's going to automatically give you a box of suggestions underneath the uh, underneath the video as you're uploading. So you don't have to do keyword research or anything like that on them. Just simply add the ones that are relevant to the video and then move on, right? So TubeBuddy just make it really quick to do that. Um, just add those and then move on. But what YouTube says is YouTube says that tags just don't matter, but the box is still there. And they also say things like, okay, well, uh, tags don't matter, but add misspellings and things like that. Well, if they don't matter 100%, then how would adding misspellings help anything, right? So because of that, the box is there. Um, it's not gonna do much, right? Like your, your video performance is not gonna matter when it comes to tags, right? Or your tags aren't gonna impact your video performance. Um, but since the box is there, just fill it out and move on, right? Don't spend a ton of time on it. Um, next up on the list here is D farm D farm uploads one time per week or more. They do gardening content. The goal of the channel is to show people how to garden. And this, the question is I'm struggling to get views. Okay. That's a statement, not a question. So if you're struggling to get views, here's what you got to think about. One, you got to think about the value that you're providing, you got actually no, because you, you're not even getting them into the value. So you got to think of the topics that you're choosing to make your videos about. Make sure that you are researching those topics. You can use Google Trends to see, you know, um, like the direction of the interest of topics. You can look for seasonality. So if you're using Google Trends, you can stretch it out over the course of like five years and look for spikes in gardening or, you know, very specific things in gardening. So you can make sure that you have content ready so that when those times hit every year, those are called tent bowl um, events when you're looking at it through the lens of a content strategy. But basically, uh, those tent pole events are things that you can prepare for and you can prepare content for it. Then you got to think about how you're going to package the videos that you are putting together in terms of the thumbnail and title, because you, you know, if you already have your topic, then you got to make the video and then the video has to perform. So if you're having trouble getting views, um, don't stress out about it instead. And I know it feels like you're wasting time, but instead of looking at it, like I'm, I'm just completely wasting time here. Look at it. Like you're learning every video that you publish that doesn't do great is something that you can learn from. It's something to where you can say, okay, I'm developing my skills right now as a content creator. I'm learning how to write better titles. I'm learning how to make better thumbnails. I'm learning how to put better content together. And as part of that process, I'm experimenting with different ways to do things. I'm experimenting with trying to understand things a little bit better. I'm experimenting with putting things together in a way to where, you know, it's going to create a better experience for the viewers and all that stuff. And you continue to do the thing while continually looking for things to improve. YouTube, the reference I get for this is, is a learning curve, just like anything else. So if you were to start podcasting today, then you would have to go through the process of learning all the tech that's behind it, learning how to put a show together, learning how to do that, learning how to you know, get traffic to it somehow. Um, if you were starting to play guitar, then in that particular case, you got to learn what guitar you're going to play. Are you going to play a banjo? Or are you going to play a nylon string guitar? Uh, are you going to play a regular string guitar? Are you going to play an electric guitar? Like what type of guitar are you going to play? Um, and that's kind of like picking your niche, right? And then you got to figure out, okay, what type of music am I going to play with this guitar? And that's like, okay, what kind of videos am I going to put out, you know, within this niche to serve, you know, this, this community around this niche. Um, and then from there, you got to start working on your fingers and get your fingers to work right. And then the fingers over here to work right while these fingers are going, you got to learn all the notes on the guitar. But you got to learn a ton of stuff in order to just be able to play guitar at a really basic level. YouTube is the same exact way. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta embrace that learning curve. So if you're struggling right now, just understand that you're in the place where almost every YouTuber goes through what it is that you're going through right now. So what you have to do is instead of looking at it through a lens of frustration, like, man, I, I, I'm just trying to get views, look at it like, okay, 
I am trying to get better at this. And as part of my process of getting better at this, I need to work on my skills that are required to do it. Just like I, if you wanted to be a guitar player, you got to work on the skills required to do it. So I got to learn some design aspects or at least some photography aspects for my thumbnails. Um, I need to learn a little bit of copywriting and a little bit of psychology so that I can make sure that I'm, you know, kind of triggering people a little bit, you know, when possible in my titles and in my video content. Um, I need to learn how to put videos together. I need to learn how to edit videos, not just cut videos but to edit videos, because there's a difference and it's a big difference. So when you're just cutting videos, you're just going in and you're just cutting out the silence. Maybe you're like zooming in and out, kind of like I do, but you're just kind of cutting out the stuff. But when you're editing a video, you've pre-planned the video and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna take them through this, right? You've pre-planned that video and then you put it in and you create segments of that video and you intentionally will stop things and intentionally start things and intentionally put emphasis on things and you take people through a process, right? There's a big difference between cutting and editing. So so because of that, you need to make sure that you're that you're thinking about that when it comes to developing your skills and learning how to do the thing. Um, you know, I I'm on Reddit a lot and on Reddit, like I'll go in there and I'll see some just very obvious things. Like people will be like, you know, like, you know, new content creators, just like here, like I can sit here and I can answer, you know, all these questions that come in because I've been doing this for over nine years. Right. So from from your lens, if you're a brand new content creator, it's like, hey, Nick knows a lot about YouTube, which I do but it's from experience on my channel and other channels as well. So when it comes to somebody that's just getting started at this, um, it's an easy thing to do. I have a friend of mine that's, that's wanting to get into YouTube right now is experimenting with videos. And one of the things that he kept saying and the messages that he was send, sending me was like, man, I'm having trouble. I can't present like, you know, all these YouTubers that I watch. And I told him, I'm like, dude, embrace where you're at. You're not those YouTubers. Those YouTubers that you're watching have made hundreds, if not, you know, over a thousand videos. And you're looking at them and you're comparing where you are at this starting point to what it is that they've been doing professionally. And that's all they've been doing. They're not balancing a job and, you know, all this other stuff with it. That's all they've been doing for the last like three years right? And you're comparing yourself to them, right? Or it's all they've been doing for, you know, nine years or like whatever. But it's like, you know, you're comparing yourself and you're getting started to them. You can't do that. Instead, be like, hey, I'm getting started with this. I'm, you know, new to this. And because of that, I got to start, you know, learning the skills required and I got to start learning how to do the thing. If you focus on that, then your likelihood of breaking through and your likelihood of turning this into like a really awesome hobby um, or a full-time gig um, is going to drastically increase. But if every video you publish, you beat yourself up and you're like, man, this is, this is garbage. I can't believe that I'm just wasting my time doing this and blah, blah. Then you're probably not going to, you're probably not going to last very long, which is fine. You know, it's not for everybody, but, but you know, if you, if you take that approach, you're probably not going to last, you know, very long. So work on the mindset, so that you can keep going and work on the work on the skill set. Work on both of those and you and you'll end up fine. Super chat. Learn Spanish world. Thank you for the super chat, man. I appreciate it. It says, um, how can I simplify editing my videos? What are some strategies to speed up your editing? Great question. So when it comes to uh when it comes to editing your videos, some things that you can do is um think about how think about your editing and the recording process this is also a thing that i was telling my friend so right now they're just in the recording process you've made a ton of videos so this isn't really going to apply to you i'm saying it for the sake of you know the others that are here but like when when you're recording videos when you're first getting started as a content creator you're just thinking of the recording process but once you start turning those videos into completed videos, you start learning things along the way. And you start learning like, huh, this is interesting. So if I start doing this when I'm recording, then that'll make this easier in the edit, right? Or if I do this when I'm recording or I shoot some of these extra scenes or some of the extra shots or something like that, then I can use these if I need them in the recording instead of having to turn my lights back on and like do all this, you know, additional stuff or go to that place again or, you know, depending on the type of content. So because of that, um, you want to, uh, you know, you want to just make sure that you are, uh, you know, thinking of that, you know, as a new content creator. But when it comes to simplifying the whole process, one, record for the edit, okay? So it's really easy to just collect a bunch of footage and just hit record and just let it run. That's really easy to do. I've found it easier to, and more efficient, to record in clips. So with your type of content, because you're teaching people Spanish, what I recommend that you try, and this might be helpful for you, what I recommend that you try is record, say the line as many times as you need to say it, and then stop. And then record, say the line as many times as you need to say it, stop. 
and just do that again and again. This will keep you fresh for every take um, and it will help you isolate um, each individual thing. And then by doing that, for me, it sped up my editing drastically because then all I have to do is I load those files into the computer and then I know and Vigard knows when he edits the videos, all we have to do is find the clip where, you know, if we start it the same way, okay, if it took me, you know, a bunch of takes and I start three different clips the same way, the last clip is going to be the one that we're going to use. And then when that last clip gets pulled into the editing software, we just look for the last waveform, then the audio. So we look for that last waveform, we can just jump right to it, bam, because that's the take, the last one, the where it's like, okay, got it, now I'm gonna move on, right? So when you record for the edit like that, then it makes finding the right clips and all of that a lot more efficient. Um, in addition to that, it's also helpful to put together templates for things that you commonly use. So if you add in-screen graphics to your videos, if you add arrows, if you add anything like that, if you have you know intros, lower thirds, any of that stuff you commonly use, slides in your case, if you have like certain backgrounds that you use and then you end up building text for those backgrounds, that kind of stuff, um, having those either in one folder where you can pull in that folder and then, you know, that entire folder of all that stuff is there in your video editing software or having the editing template itself already contain those things. And then by doing that, you copy and paste that template before you start making your video. And then those things are just automatically referenced when you open the file. And then that way you already have everything in there and you just move things around, you know, around the video as you're making it. So, um, so those types of things can definitely be helpful as well. Um, other things, I don't do this one, but it was recommended to me. Um, and the reason I don't do it is because uh, because it requires me turning on like extra audio devices and stuff. Um, but efficiency wise, it makes sense. So this might be something you might want to try, but you can use services like Descript. Um, and what Descript will do, technically you can do it on your phone too. Um, if you just have like a notepad on your phone and you turn on the text option, is in that scenario that I was talking about before where you are repeating clips until you nail it, if you start it the same way, right? Because you're like, okay, I ended it like this, so I'm gonna start it like this. And then you repeat that, you know, on a few clips. So one of the things that you can do is either in Descript or, you know, the notes on your phone, you can turn on the audio and then you can record your audio going in and then it's going to type it out as you're saying it. And then that way you'll know exactly where it is that you started it every time so that you can just jump, you know, right into that instead of having, like sometimes I'll be like, oh, how did I start that? And I'll have to like go back and, and watch it. And a remote is also great because with the remote controls, that also makes it to where if you do need to preview it, you can. Um, and, you know, you can start and stop, you know, a bunch and things like that. Great question. Hit the sub button. Hit the like button. If you're having fun, comment, type something. If you're laying back, leaning and engage. Just take a second. Smash the whole page. Okay, Catatainment is our next question. They do daily content, but on YouTube for less than a year. Um, they do, the type of channel is cat content. The goal of the channel is to build a clientele of cat parents. The question is, Nick, on YouTube analytics page under watch hours, even though shorts watch time um, doesn't count for 4K needed to fill out YouTube partner program, does you still, do YouTube still put it there? So it really skews the numbers of your watch time if you're trying to track it as it updates on the earn page. So yeah, so on the earn page, you are getting credited for the watch time that only the watch time that counts towards you getting monetized. Next, we've got uh, Yasync and a bunch of zeros. <laughs> they do fitness content. The goal of the channel is 100,000 subscribers. How many subscribers do you have? Just, just drop in the chat right now how many subscribers you have for everybody that's hanging out here. If you are on YouTube or another platform, um, just drop in the chat how many, how many subscribers you have. Um, but the question is, I post twice a week. I've diversified from making martial arts content to gym content. Will this affect my channel a lot? Two questions. So I start a new channel because my views have tanked. Also, can you give any advice for breaking into a super competitive niche? So when it comes to being to a competitive niche, um, one of the things to think about is it's always competitive for like, how can I say this? Okay. So if you go into any niche, there's a lot of people making content that doesn't get a response. And then there's a decent amount of people making content that get some kind of response. 
And then there's a lot fewer people making content that typically gets a decent response. And then there's even fewer people that are making content that gets like the best response for the niche, right? So when it comes to um, breaking into the niche, it really comes down to, and I know this answer isn't going to be exactly what it is that you're, that you're looking for, but it's true. If you want to break into any niche, it's going to come down to your willingness to put together content that has the highest amount of satisfaction for the viewer, which translates into people are clicking it at a very competitive rate and they're enjoying that content for a competitive amount of time. They're engaging with that content in terms of liking it, subscribing, sharing that content, you know, all of those things um, at a very competitive rate for the platform. In addition to that, they're coming back to your channel on a regular basis because you understand the idea that you're making a channel that is dedicated for a very specific type of viewer that's interested in very specific things. So therefore they keep coming back to the channel on a regular basis. When you do all of those things, it helps you stand out in a competitive niche because all of those things, like everybody has a threshold of what they're willing to do, right? Because you have like, hey, I know all this stuff. Like, you know, there's a lot of people here that know all the stuff. It's just, you know, a lot of people here, you know, some people here, they're just not willing to do, you know, the things that they know, right? So because of that, you know, it puts you in a situation where it's like, okay, well, I know how to do the thing. I'm just not doing the thing. So, you know, you have to make sure that if you're like really wanting to go after it and you're really wanting to stand out in the niche, you have to cross that threshold of I know what to do versus like I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it. Right. And that includes every thumb every video that i make i'm making multiple thumbnails i'm going to test those thumbnails at different parts of the process every video that i make i'm looking in my audience retention reports and i'm looking to see exactly where people leave and then every piece of content after that when i start noticing patterns of people leaving the video i'm going to experiment with something new that i'm doing around those time periods that will cause people to stay if i'm trying to you know break through and stand out i'm also going to look for flat lines on my audience retention and i'm going to try to do more of those things in future videos i'm going to try to understand why people that are watching my videos are responding better to those areas. I'm trying to understand why people are leaving when I do these other things. I'm going to try to understand why people are rewinding these particular parts of my videos and they're rewatching these or they're sharing these videos out at these particular points of the, of the video. Like you start, you know, really digging in and trying to really understand your viewers, how they respond to the content and you start hanging out in like the communities around that content so that you can understand the viewers even more. Um, like, you know, you gotta, you know, do the thing if you wanna stand out in a, in a competitive niche. But in terms of, you know, the martial art content versus the gym content, um, I would say that that's, you know, towards two different types of viewers because there's a lot of people that go to the gym that don't care about martial arts. There's a lot of people that do martial arts that will also go to the gym, um, but you know, there's also a lot that probably don't and that only use martial arts as their fitness. So because of that, I would get clarity there on the channel. And in terms of starting a new channel, since your views have tanked on the new content, um, if the channel's not, you know, that, if it's not moving along that much yet, then yeah, I would go, I would go ahead and start um, a new one or um, I would just commit to the new way that you're going to go and just go hard um, on that. Yeah, you got 230 subscribers on the channel. So yeah, I would, I would, I would keep going on this channel. You are definitely fine for, for a pivot. I would keep going on the channel that you have, um, but I would just make sure that you are, you know, consistently putting out the fitness content so you can build up that audience. Because right now, YouTube's probably testing your content against people um, that are not you know, into the fitness as much, but because they're responding well it, recently to your martial arts content, it thinks that, you know, hey, let's show them this and see if they enjoy it. Um, so that's probably what's hurting you right now, but you'll you'll be able to get through that, you know, relatively soon as long as you keep publishing on a, on a somewhat regular basis. So really quick for subscriber counts in here, um, just to, you know, just to, you know, just to share here, we got Pro Coder in here with 8,800 subscribers approaching 9,000. Love it. We got Yas with 230. Apocalyptic Perspective with 322. We got a we got a little stack of them there in the 300s from AIM Music and Tau Fit. Uh, Crazy Maze Stash 883. Steve Logic Long 707. Doug Houston Y Fee getting ready. To, YT getting ready to hit 10,000 subscribers. Love it. Uh, Miss Bella uh, 489. We got Guyver with nine. Welcome to YouTube. Um, we got Life on YouTube and Twitter over a thousand. Calvin the Unfindable. 103 Shark Scrapper 9,554 also approaching 10,000. Love it. Um, Sheila Crossing 1588. Um, we've got uh, I Know a Guy Bicycles 3,500. Magic Flying Potato 5,600 rolling up on 6K. Uh, Jerry Pop Andrea 6,143. 
Love it. 123, 112. Yeah, great. Yeah, nice big span here. We got Deborah with 15,000. Love it. Uh, American English with Brent, uh, 27,000. Yeah, great. Oh, sorry, 26,000. Sorry. Uh, yeah, great. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. All right. Uh, we got Ty's Hot Mess History with 148,000 um, as well. Yeah, it's good. Love it, love it, love it. All right. So uh, we got Jarrett Jamal with uh, 11,000 here. We got Thinking This with 26. Great. Love it. Okay. So next up on our list here, um, to get back into the questions, we have CG Next Gen. Um, they're getting ready to start their channel. It's going to be an animation channel, and the goal of the channel is to build a community around their art. And the question is, can you succeed with 3D animations on YouTube? Is it even possible to build a business around it? Um, I would say it probably is possible to build a business around it, but it would probably be more service related and, you know, like doing animations for others when it comes to the 3d animations on YouTube. If it's just like, if you mean that you're going to tell stories through animation, then yes, all day long. Um, if you mean that I'm going to put up a video of just a rotating chair that I made out of 3d, not so much, but if you are going to do the option with a rotating chair in 3D, then in that case, I recommend that you start showing people how to do the 3D. And then that way you'll be able to build as you grow. And then as people are coming in, they're looking, you know, to solve problems around how to do all the different things around th building 3D animations, then you'll be able to help them with that. Um, that would be, uh, in my opinion, I mean, I could be wrong, but in my opinion, I think that would be a faster path than... I'm going to upload this like 30 second clip of just a chair, like a 3d chair that I made. Right. So the whole thing when it comes to YouTube is regardless of the content that you're putting out, you need to be providing some type of value. If you're just showing a rotating uh, 3d chair, there's not much value attached to that. But if you're teaching people how to make 3d animations, there's value. If you're telling stories, through 3D animation. There's value because you have the entertainment value of the story. So uh, so think of it through the lens of like, okay, if is there value that you can provide? If the answer is yes, then in that case, you know, you can have a channel around it. If the answer is like, eh, there's no real value attached to this, then keep looking for stuff until you can find something you can do with value. Next question. Pook scoop, poop scoops for noobs. Oops, wrong one. Next question. What's up, man? Haven't seen you in a while. Um, they have a Pooper Scooper channel. Goal of the channel is to be the destination channel for other scoopers and small business owners. The question is, what are your thoughts on the whole Matt Pat moving on from his channel? Should creators worry about the longevity of their creator career in terms of mental health and finding balance? Mental health and finding balance is extremely important. I did a whole mental shift when uh, around 2020, once all that stuff went down, I did a total mental shift and went from a grind it out no matter what mind state to like, hey, I'm going to make sure that I'm living a life of balance and that I'm enjoying every day even more than I was prior to that time. So uh, when it comes to mental health, it is extremely important. Finding balance is important, but there's also times where you need to, you know, kind of push yourself a bit. So depending on where you are in the process, um, you know, I would definitely just identify that sometimes you need to go a little bit harder than others and, uh, you know, embrace those times when you do have to go hard. Um, and when it comes to the longevity. So one thing, one thing that, um, that, uh, Matt Koval mentioned, this was, I actually started my bid summit presentation two years ago with this, not the one that just happened, but the one prior, um, where he mentioned that through his time as YouTube's creator liaison, um, and, you know, through all the creators that he worked with, through his experience, which it might be a little bit different now, right? Because everything changes and evolves. But he found that the average lifespan of a content creator is about seven years. So with that, it's not that they just get there and, and quit because, you know, of frustration or whatever. It's just that some people, they'll just go and then they'll, you know, and then they'll just get tired of being on the hamster wheel and then they'll kind of bow out from there. Some people, they'll make enough money to where they'll retire off of it. Some people will make enough money to where they'll start additional businesses that will require their time and they'll just go all into that. Some people will get additional opportunities from their YouTube channel that that they never expected and then they'll end up taking those opportunities and then that will pull attention away from their channel and then they'll slowly stop uploading to the channel. And then you have situations like, you know, Matt Pat to where, you know, it's like, hey, 
you know, like he's been on the grind for quite some time, grown his, his main channel to 18 million subscribe, 18.7, I think it is million subscribers. And, uh, you know, that take, that requires a substantial amount of work and effort and like thought and all of that. And, uh, you know, because of that, you know, he's put in his time. So it's not necessarily that, uh, you know, when you do this, that you should think of it as like, you know, hey, um, I need to just be pedal to the floor the entire time. You can if you want to, um, but instead you should think, okay, if I can get this whole thing to work out like I want it to, then while all of that's happening, start thinking of like how you're going to land the plane. Like, are you going to do what he did where you like grow it up and then you're like, you know what, I'm going to step away or I'm going to hire other people to do it or, you know, like whatever. Or you're just going to just say, hey, I'm just going to leave the channel up, but then I'm just going to, you know, step away and I'm just going to do it quietly and nobody's even going to know. I'm just going to stop uploading videos, right? But but knowing what it is that you're going to do next um, is is also something that can be helpful because then as your channel's thriving and you're in that period, um, then you can just start looking at, you know, like, okay, I'm going to take this that I'm doing from this channel and I'm going to start applying it to what it is that I'm going to do in the future, right? Like um, not too long ago, I hopped on a call uh, with a content creator. He had like a little over 2 million subscribers on his channel. And one of the things that uh, he was doing was um, he was wanting to get his channel kind of started back again because what he did was he grew the channel up pretty quick um, and he took the money from that and he took he started investing into real estate and then he you know got a nice you know amount of like condos and houses and stuff and then he took uh, you know like once that was rolling then he was like okay I took this break now I'm going to come back and you know start on my channel again so you know he's in one of those situations where he took the bag so to speak applied it to some other stuff and then now he has that money coming in while he's coming back to his YouTube channel or why he came back and he you know, doing that whole thing again. So uh, there's a lot of different paths that you can take. But the idea is that, uh, you know, it's important to make sure that you do have some type of loose planned in mind. Because you know, the, the experience that you get to have for all of you new content creators here, the experience that you get to have as a content creator, there's going to be things that there, there's probably things that are going to become that are going to come your way, you know, once your channel hits a th certain threshold that you never even thought about where you're like, wow, I never thought I'd have, you know, these people offering me this opportunity over here. And when those things start happening, you know, um, it, you know, it, it can be pretty amazing. And uh, as part of that, um, it can also put you in a position to where, you know, in the future, um, you know, it can create stuff for after, you know, YouTube. For me, I plan to do this for a really long time, like until, you know, the people that want until you, right, until you stop watching my videos, um, I'm just going to keep, you know, helping content creators. And the reason for that is because this whole thing has made such a gigantic impact on me, that if every stream or every video that I make or whatever, if I can just get one person over the line, that that then that's that's fine for me. If it's more, even better. But if I can just get one person over the line with every video that I publish uh, or every piece of content that I publish, then in my brain, that's, you know, I'm giving back um, and I'm, you know, putting some type of good um, into the world. And it's, and, you know, like, um, it's, you know, YouTube is hard, but, you know, it's also not hard at the same time. Like in terms of the actual process, it's hard mentally, which is why burnout is such a big deal on YouTube. It's hard mentally. But in terms, because you're always thinking about trying to come up with good ideas and, you know, you're you're pressuring yourself that way. But in terms of like, okay, um, I, like if you're doing Mr. Beast content to where you have these huge productions, then yeah, it's hard. But if you are somebody that's doing like, you know, reaction videos or educational videos or, you know, like, uh, like Jerry, he does like food reviews and stuff like that type of content, you know, it's not necessarily technically hard, right? It's mentally hard because you got to think, okay, am I going to start this? If they, if I start it this way and I say this, is there a better way to say it? And you, you know, you have all those things, but in terms of the technical aspect, it's not hard technically, right? So, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll keep doing it until the wheels fall off. Um, let's see here. So, uh, so Renee says, uh, YouTube's creator liaison, he mentions that, uh, he says, I would suggest creators should sell, should celebrate that YouTube is a mature enough industry where creators can be so successful they can retire off their main channel and experiment with new things. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah, like the amount of like, uh, you know, very financially stable um, and just where their future is taken care of and they don't have to worry about anything. Content creators that I know that do this professionally and been doing it for a while, um, there, there's a lot. Like it, it's definitely possible. 
if you are willing to do what it takes to, to make it happen. Um, and he also mentioned that MatPat is still going to be running the channels, just not hosting them. So, yeah, so then he can, like, you know, if he doesn't want to shave, he doesn't have to, right? All those little details. <laughs> oh, love it. So uh, let's see here. So uh, really quick, uh, learn Spanish charged. world, and then we're going to get back into the questions. It says, I... Uh, I used to have a lot of lawyer viewers, even though I knew their names, they stopped interacting. They disappeared. Most of my viewers now are new. Is this a sign? Um, is this only to be expected? Yeah, pe people come and go. Like, you know, my channel's the same way to where, you know, like I've got, you know, some people that have been around the whole time. Then I've got other people that, you know, have came in, they've been around for a while, and then they've either moved on from YouTube or they've gotten, you know, successful enough to where they don't, you know, to where they're like, eh, most of the stuff that Nick talks about, I know it already, I do it already. So they might come in and check in and be like, hey, I just want to, you know, kind of refresh or something like that. But, you know, some people just move on because, you know, the, uh, the information is well internalized and they're doing the thing and they're doing it at a high level. So they can just move on. Um, let's see here next. Okay. Back into the form. So next up we've got great question there. Poop scoop for noobs kind of sent us on a, a little thing there. So, uh, we got, uh, Inglano's education. And I hope I'm saying that right. They do legal education. The goal of the channel is monetization. And the question is I'm getting good watch time with AI narrated one hour long videos. Do you think using AI and date is dangerous long-term? Well, you're going to have to disclose that um, when it comes to AI. Some people aren't going to care. Some people will. Um, so you're just going to have to navigate that. Like right now, I really don't know what to expect. Like I, I can predict, you know, I can be like, yeah, you know, uh, you know, I think that, you know, there's going to be a really quick period of time. Like there kind of is right now to where like TikTok, YouTube short stuff like that. you got the full animated voices and things like that. And, you know, people respond to them. I respond to them also. But when it comes to being a human, you know, we also want that connection. Now, once AI can synthesize that connection in some way to where it sounds so real that we can't tell um then you know it's it's gonna start get confused get confusing there and then it'll be you know an easier path forward but i really see the transition back into just like super authenticity um being the way in the the way forward in the very near future um you know you have a lot of and i, and I think tiktok is kind of part to blame for this but it's a good thing in my opinion but like with TikTok, one of the great things about it, and this is, you know, why I think YouTube did shorts also is, well, one, so I didn't just lose everybody to the short form. But like when it um, comes to TikTok, one of the things that they were really good at and they're getting ready to break, you know, with their, or they're breaking now with their, you know, when they start letting the 30 minute content go out. Um, but one of the things that's cool about TikTok is you can be on your phone without any fancy lights, without, you know, a microphone, without anything, without any experience, you can just start making videos just talking to people. And some of those videos will just get crushed with views, right? And it's because people enjoy authenticity. They respond well to authenticity. And I think part of that is TikTok. I think part of it was because we all went inside for a period of time and we spent, you know, our, our social interactions were on Zoom calls, which made all that really a lot more normal when we started seeing content that was like that as well. So I think just the whole move back towards, you know, there's going to be a place for everything, but I think that there's going to be, a um, with viewership, I think just a, a stronger slide back towards just like, you know, just raw authenticity with people because, you know, people just love connecting with people and hearing people's stories and, you know, all that stuff. So I think we're going to see a big move, uh, towards that again from blue to green. Super chat. Thank you. For the super chat. But when it comes to AI voices, I know it allows you to uh, deliver the long lectures on the basis of your notes and you don't have time to narrate everything yourself. That's cool. I understand. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, starting channels with AI voices and stuff like that and, you know, other social media accounts. Um, all that's fine. Um, but I'm just saying that, uh, like, I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong. Like, people are responding to that type of content right now. But what I'm saying is you're going to have to be disclosing that soon. Um, and that may or may not turn some people off when it comes to that content. Um, but I think that because of the mass influx of people doing what it is that you're doing, I think that that area of content is going to get really uh, stagnant and it's going to be really hard to distinguish, you know, different channels from each other and things like that. So it'll still be okay at the video level, but I don't think that it's going to create any real connection with people, right? Because you can't, right? So it's 100% it's topic, 0% creator. Whereas if you're not on camera, but you're still narrating with your voice, you can still squeeze in your nuance of your personality through the way that you communicate. With AI, it doesn't have a personality at this point in time, 
right? So, uh, so until it does, and they're distinguishable personalities with noticeable nuance in them, then I think people will still, you know, gravitate towards human beings. Um, so, uh, Renee mentions that, uh, he said, OG YouTube solved for distribution. Any solo creator can share their voice in a way that used to take major studios. AI could solve for, for production. Any solo creator could make, uh, ILM and, uh, Weta class SFX. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, as an example of the, uh, you know, effects and stuff like this whole thing, all of this, um, I did the text in Photoshop and I did some tweaks to it in Photoshop cause it got the logos wrong. I had to reupdate the logos and stuff, but that new animation that I've been playing today, the car was made in mid journey. Then I went to Photoshop and I cut all the pieces out, cut the wheels out so I could rotate them. Um, the background was made in, uh, uh, chat or sorry, the car was made in chat GPT, um, the different angles of the car. And then the background was made in mid journey. And then I put that into the editing software and then I, you know, desaturated it to give it kind of like a look. Um, and the, my shots were all green screen, but where you see popcorn in the video and I'll play it here in just a second for anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about. And, um, popcorn in the video, I used AI to cut out popcorn because I didn't have popcorn in front of a green screen. So I took a video that I already had. And then I ran that through runway ML, which has like a built-in green screen thing. Hey, there's popcorn right now, as a matter of fact, but, uh, but basically I ran it through that and then it cut out popcorn. Um, and then that allowed me to be able to use uh, popcorn in the video. So in terms of like what is possible with, you know, the AI stuff, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to get pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Hit the sub button, hit the like button. If you're having fun, comment, type something. If you're laying back, leaning and engage. Just take a second to smash the whole page. So Lazarus reacts. Thanks for the, that's the video that I was talking about in terms of the stuff, but the graphics all AI generated, but I just took them into Photoshop, made some tweaks to them, you know, put more emphasis on the logos. It had the logo on the front of the car was white with like a red triangle in it or the red play button in it. So I had to change that and remake everything in Photoshop. I had to remake the one on the door. I posted some, uh, I posted it around yesterday just to get some initial feedback on it real quick. And then I took the post down. But, uh, uh, but when I posted that, it didn't have all the additional stuff in there. Um, but the version that you're seeing there is one step away from final. I'm still working on the graphics for a back view because basically what I want to happen is I want, as that initial shot is, uh, is happening with the car, you know, driving through the city to kind of set the scene. I also want a back shot of the car to where it's like a low shot. I've got, I've got the image already, but it's a low shot. I just have to put the logos all over it, but it's a low shot of the car. Um, and then I just want that low shot also driving through the city and then it will switch, you know, switch over to the thing. So then that way I got like two good cuts before the actual video start kind of sets the scene a little bit. So next up we got shark scrapper, shark scrapper. Uh, he does content one time, uh, per, week or more. The goal of the channel is to promote recycling and to grow a revenue stream. And the question is, I recently had a regular viewer comp complain that YouTube puts 10 ads on an 11 minute video of mine. I suspect they're exaggerating, but it brings the question, should we just go with the YouTube default for ad placement or go back and make adjustments? But the new ad placement option, I've just been letting the algo do its thing, your thoughts. So if you are putting content together to where, like, let's say you're telling a story and in that story that you're telling, if there was an ad that jumped in the middle of it, then it would be super interruptive and completely throw everybody off of the story. That's where you want to make those adjustments yourself. Um, if you are, you know, publishing something and you're like, yeah, this is, I've gotten monetized through my meditation music channel. And I do not want people to have, you know, mid-roll ads while they're listening to this. Then, of course, you'd go in there and turn them off. Um, outside of that, if you wanted to have them and let YouTube select it, you can. Keep in mind, there is an ad tolerance. So one of the things that, that YouTube does is it will start figuring out, okay, when people are, you know, interact, when this user is interacting with YouTube, if we show them, you know, an ad every so this many often, then, you know, um, they don't skip them or they wait to skip them or whatever. They don't leave the platform. So like it's tracking all that stuff. So when somebody comes into a video and they see 10 ads in an 11 minute video, they're probably exaggerating. But with that said, um, I've seen um, on Reddit, cause, cause YouTube is just getting just, just beat up right now because you have this whole group of people that are anti paying for anything. So therefore they won't pay for premium. And then there's the other side 
which is, uh, you know, like, hey, you know, you just get premium and you don't have to worry about it. But the uh, anti-premium people, they're getting shut down because they're using ad blockers and stuff. And YouTube's detecting that and they're shutting them down. And some people are need, are having to start watching ads now because they refuse to pay. So for some of those people, they're showing screenshots of like, hey, I got this. And it's got like three, you know, two ads on it before the video even starts and, you know, things like that. So, you know, there is a little bit of a problem there. But, uh, but you know, with that said, I would only be concerned if the content that you're putting together is story based to where they need to be like focused in on the story and you can't afford just for the sake of it being you know a good story and a good video you can't afford an interruptive ad just randomly popping up while you're like building up to the climax of a story right so um so that's that's how you want to think about that lost rvers Super should poor low view duration videos be deleted um i would leave them um i would leave them on the channel but i would you know repackage them i would try to learn from repackage them with you know thumbnails and titles that maybe you know might create a better expectation from the outside they could possibly cause them to do a little bit better but really like i would i would leave them on the channel as long as they are focused on the same audience like if it's a if it's for a totally different type of viewer then in that case you know you might want to unlist them but if it is you know for the same type of people then i would leave them because some people like as your channel grows keep in mind with every video you publish you're getting in front of a few more people that have never seen your content before and for those people that have never seen your content before some of them will go and they'll find value in some of that older content so when you leave it up there it just gives them the opportunity to also enjoy that content that you've put up in the past as long as it's a good fit for them Yeah, and also some clarity here really quick um, from uh, from Renee. He says that when it comes to ads, this is just a little, uh, you know, public service message here says you're not adding ads, you're adding slots that could potentially hold an ad. Not every slot will be filled. That depends on a bunch of factors. You could say eight slots and only two ads will play. Thank you, as always, for the clarity. <laughs> oh, it's great. Next up, we've got um, Always Calm. Always Calm does meditation content. Um, the I think we did this one already, but they say the goal is to relax and take care of their mental health. And the question is, the YouTube promote bin, uh, button, is it recommended or are those fake subscribers? They're real subscribers. But here's the thing, when it comes to... When it comes to using any type of paid promotion, it doesn't matter if it's YouTube ads, if it's Google ads, you know, where you're promoting YouTube, it doesn't matter if you're buying ads on other websites, whatever the thing is, is if you don't learn how to get an organic response on YouTube, as soon as you shut that off, you're still right back at zero where you can't get people to respond organically. So then you're stuck in this thing where it seems like YouTube becomes pay for play because then it's like, man, every time I turn off these ads, my channel dies. Well, the reason that happens is because you haven't learned how to get an organic response yet. If you learn how to get an organic response, then you technically, I, I have, a, I have a, a friend of mine that he runs promotional advertisements from his YouTube channel, and he also gets an organic response. He does both simultaneously, both do fantastic. He grows his channel awesomely. He has a thriving community of people that love his content, love his channel, love everything that he does, and he balances out yeah, I'm paying for ads that will lead to sales and things like that. And also, you know, exposure to the channel, but I'm also putting out really good content. So if he has a period of time where he stops running ads, he'll lose those ad views, but his channel will still keep going awesome because he knows how to get an organic response. So when it comes to, you know, um, using that particular tool, it's important to first not look at it as a shortcut. When it comes to YouTube, shortcuts do not exist. There are more efficient ways to do things. There are tactics and strategies and all that. But when it comes to shortcuts, they just don't exist. Like you, you, you can't trick YouTube. You can't trick viewers, right? Like there's not, there's not a shortcut that you can do that will cause, you know, everything to change all of a sudden. It's a tweak to where it's like, oh, I started doing this thing that now makes it, you know, easier for people to identify this video is something that they care about now my video now my channel's on better or i started doing you know these tweaks to how i put my videos together now people are responding to them better they're enjoying them more and now my videos are doing better right that's how it works it's not like hey i'm just going to use this promotion tab and then when i turn it off then my channel's just going to be you know awesome it doesn't work that way you gotta you, you can't shortcut the process of learning how to do the thing and uh, really quick, uh, Renee also mentioned that deleting or privating videos removes those videos from people's watch history, so they may be less likely to be recommended your videos in the future. 
And also, okay, these were side conversations too. Okay. So thank you for that one as well. Next up, we've got Vologi. Vologi uploads one time per week or more. They do cycling content. The goal of the channel is to share information and help fellow cyclists. The question, do you think utilizing the YouTube multi-language audio feature will help reaching new audience better than, uh, than using captions? Any idea about MLA rollout timetable? Um, it was launched almost a year ago, but I've not seen it at least here in Finland. So I have it on my YouTube channel. Um, currently, I haven't used it yet. I'm actually working with uh, somebody that is going to start uh, publishing those to my channel. I actually have to send them some videos this week um, that are going to start, you know, um, adding some multi-language audio to some of my videos. So I'll be able to give you more details on that in the future. But as of uh, right now, it's going to be rolling out to people this year. Um, some people are already, you know, starting to have it, but it's going to be rolling out to more people. Um, in terms of, of the timetable, I'm not exactly sure when everybody's going to get it, but it is coming very soon. Um, and in terms of will it help reach new audiences better than using captions, I think you'll want to still do all of the things. And the reason that you should do all of the things is because, and by all the things, I mean all the translations. So upload the multi-language audio. You're going to need to translate your metadata. So you're going to need to translate your title. You're going to need to translate your description, and you're going to need to translate your captions as well. So what you do is you are going to, uh, yep, I, I, I will grab that here in just a second, Doug, thank you. Um, but, uh, but basically by using all those things, how it will work is when you are publishing videos and it has all of the translation stuff involved, including the multi-language audio, then YouTube is going to show your content to people that speak those languages and they're going to see the title in their native language. They're gonna click on that video. And then as soon as they click on that video, it's going to present to them in their native language as well. They're gonna hear audio in their native language. So that's the importance of making sure that you're also translating the titles and descriptions so that you can also make sure that it's, you know, that they're able to see it in their, their language too. So a quick thing for everybody to think about here, as YouTube is rolling out this technology and as this technology will end up getting more popular and it will become a standard of sorts as long as it works the way that we all think it's gonna work, then one thing to start thinking about is if you are heavily reliant on using text in your thumbnails, start thinking about, okay, if I'm going to be targeting, and some of you will, some of you won't, you know, target, you know, multi-language, you know, um, audio and all of that. But if I am going to be using multi-language audio, and if I am going to make my content accessible for people that speak other languages, then in that particular case, if I want it to be presented to them like it's one of their videos, then in that particular case, I probably shouldn't use text in my thumbnails if I'm putting English there, but I'm trying to reach people in uh, like Hindi language, right? So because of that, start thinking like, how can I use imagery more? How can I use symbolism more? How can I use, you know, um, things like that to, to reference what this video is about versus just relying on text to tell the story. Okay. So, and, and just like everything on YouTube, like I, I suspect that probably, you know, like as they roll out that, you know, that particular feature that the people that are using it heavily are probably going to do uh, okay with growing those audiences um, because they'll be the first ones in. And it, I think that it'll probably be kind of like a novelty of sorts for other places. Like for example, if I was on my homepage of YouTube and YouTube shows me something in Japanese and I go in, but they show it to me in English, but they translate everything into English, but it's a Japanese piece of content. If I go in there and I'm like, wow, this is, this is crazy. Then I'll tell everybody I know about it. I'll be like, oh, you got to check this, this, this Japanese channel out. They translated everything. Like you can, you can like experience it in English. You got to check this out. I would tell everybody about it. I think that same thing is going to, uh, is going to happen when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the people that are that are aggressive about using that particular feature. If you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. Oh yeah, he says people are already asking for multi-language thumbnails and multi-track video, of course, yeah. Yeah, like the, I think the um I think all of that is great. Um but you know, one thing at a time, I think. But yeah, I think all that, you know, it would be great being able to, you know, have, you know, somebody like when you make thumbnails, be like, yeah, I need you, I need you to make thumbnails in, you know, all these different languages. Yeah, I, th I think that'd be cool. A lot of places to go wrong there too. <laughs> uh, really quick, uh, Courageous Super Painting tight. says, uh, is that a touchscreen monitor in front of you? I like that setup and how large uh, the screen is. Yeah, this is a, let's see here. If I go to, nope, that one doesn't show it. 
This one kind of does. Um, yeah, so this is a, um, duh, you saw it here. Yeah, so this is a touchscreen. Um, it's a Dell monitor. Um, and you can set it up like a normal monitor, but I laid this one down so that I can put my camera here at the angle that it's in. But yeah, I can touch it. I can use a mouse with it, or I can just touch it and move stuff around that way. It just makes it really easy for me when I'm doing these to where I don't have to fumble around with the mouse all the time. Um, okay, so next up here, let me hop in. There was a super chat that I missed, so I want to make sure that I uh, get that sorted. Oh, that's weird. That's not showing up. Okay, there we go. And then we are going to get into the thing here. Oh, that's getting a little bit buggy there. Let me refresh that. So in the meantime, really quick, so <clears throat> for those of you that are interested while I'm waiting for this thing to load here, yeah, this right here, this is what I use for my switching. So this is where I trigger the sound effects, Super. right? And then this right here is um, is where I do all the camera switching. So this happens automatically, like I set up macros for this, and then it switches everything um, automatically right here um, to where I can just plug in, you know, different cameras. And then uh, and then it can switch to, you know, whatever, whichever macro it is that I uh, that I have it set to. All right, so Lazarus Reacts, um, I think is the one that I missed, I apologize, says, um, yes, 15 minutes ago there. So it says, uh, could adding something like Author Reacts to my anime reaction channel help me stand out? Yeah, technically it could. If you have any type of, um, you know, expertise like that, then, you know, having that type of thing in there can be helpful. Um, test it and see if people respond to it. But um, if, if the, like, an author, that is making anime would probably have more, you know, authority, but I'm not sure how to express that, you know, outside of like artist, but maybe author would, you know, as well. But yeah, doing those types of things is definitely, uh, is definitely something that can be advantageous. So I would definitely, uh, I would definitely experiment with that and see if it, uh, see if it makes a difference or not. Uh, people in politics says Super I changed the subject on my channel and unlisted a lot of unrelated videos. It means that I have a lot less vids, but is it the best thing to do? So if you change the subject of your channel, um, in that particular case, I think you did the right thing because if the videos are not going to be targeted towards that same audience, then in that particular case, you are now going to be, uh, you're now going to, you know, be, you've now made it to where anybody that's interacting with the channel, they can go and binge watch your content because now everything is relevant to them. And when they come in and they enjoy one piece of content or maybe two or three, maybe they watch a playlist or something. When YouTube has your archive to select from for what they should recommend to that person to watch next. Now you don't have anything that can pollute, you know, that particular, uh, that particular thing. Zen Buster music, Roberto Blake in the house. What's up, my man. He said, uh, uh, manga artist reacts. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one too. Yeah, for the instead of the uh, author, just trying to be clear, right? There's the whole idea because, like, you know, author is like one level, but like manga artist is like a whole other, you know, level for that. So that's kind of the idea I'm trying to express there. Uh, so here, next up, we've got <clears throat> simplist, uh, simplistically digital uploads one time per week or more. They do technology content. The goal of the channel is a creative outlet and side hustle. The question is. I'm getting over 300,000 views a month channel wide, but I'm not seeing the money. Do you know why this is possibly happening? I know each situation is different. So um, if you're talking about ad revenue, just in general, um, I'm not sure how long you've been doing that. You should have done okay during the holidays, but you know, your ad revenue is going to vary depending on who is watching your content in terms of like where in the world they're watching from, um, the very specific things that you talk about, because I know you're talking about technology, but, uh, but you know, just the very specific things that you talk about are also going to impact that as well as ad inventory. So that's why typically after the holidays, you'll see a drop in, you know, um, in your CPM and everything because there's just not as much inventory out there or, or you'll see a drop in just the revenue you're generating in general from ads um, because you know there just isn't you know as much uh, advertising going on at that much time or at that time and jerry's ad revenue actually tanked during the uh the holidays so uh see here. so next up <clears throat> we've got uh mike also mike <laughs> is the name of the channel. The type of channel is long form of an hour of uh, flat tire electric bikes and places that I go. The goal of the channel is to sell products in the description. And the question is, I don't know where to post my videos, travel, sports, people, and blogs. My videos are also 
over an hour and the average length that people watch is seven minutes. Um, so do you have anybody completing your videos? If, they're com if, if you have people completing your videos, some people, then it makes sense to have them longer like that. But if you're only getting seven minutes um, out of people, then you probably shouldn't be uploading, you know, like maybe cut it down to 30. See if people will watch, you know, for that same seven minutes. Um, if you cut it down to 30 and then maybe you get more people that will watch, you know, the 30 compared to an hour. But in terms of you don't know where to post your videos, post them to YouTube, but you do travel content, sports content, and all oh, you don't know, oh, got it. You don't know what category. Got it. Okay, so if you do flat tire electric bikes in places that you go. So, oh, fat tire electric bikes in the places that you go with those bikes. So you're doing kind of like a vlog. Yeah, I would do sports or people in vlogs. I would do, I would do one of those because you're not really making travel content unless you're actually traveling, unless you're actually traveling with it. Grub Mud, what's going on? Hope you're doing great. Salute to you. Next, we got 22M. They do music mashups. The goal of the channel is to show my work, but I'm considering making more educational stuff or talk show-like content. The question, have you been struggling with automatic content ID? I even asked YouTube uh, people to provide a form where one could fill out all the copyrighted content they used as proof of goodwill and transparency, but their answer was just lame. They aimed me at the forum rights holders fill to submit a violation of their rights. Do you think this could be a good idea? Of course, this would be for volunteers having a good understanding of copyright, fair use, and so on. Copyright is a legal issue. It's not a YouTube issue. So it doesn't matter what platform you're uploading to. Everybody has, has to comply to copyright law. Some people are more uh, uh, strict about it than others. Um, but when it comes to the uh, content ID system, in my opinion, there's there's tons of stuff they could do to fix it um, because I think that especially when it comes to music, that it's just a, just a total mess. And uh, you know, I think the music companies are, you know, getting a lot of profit off of it that they probably shouldn't get because it's such a mess. Um, but when it comes to the content ID system, it is kind of messy, but in terms of having additional forms and like, you know, for goodwill and transparency, things like that, um, I don't think that's even necessary because giving somebody credit, unless you're using it, it, unless you're using something that requires attribution, um, it, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't do any good anyway. So if you're using something that's copyright protected, it doesn't matter what your goodwill is. If you're not using it in a fair use way, then you're using it incorrectly. So because of that, I don't think they should have that uh, form that people fill out and, and let them know. If you run into an issue, then you can dispute it and, you know, things like that. But in terms of like part of your upload process, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessary. Next up on the uh, list here, <clears throat> I'm going to grab a quick water in the meantime. Hit the sub button, hit the like button. If you're having fun, comment, type something. If you're laying back, leaning and engage. Just take a second to smash the whole page. Yeah, so I see your comment here. You say, um, in your case, it's always fair use. Yeah, so in that case, if it's always fair use, then you can always dispute it. So then it's not even an issue. So you'll get the red flag, so to speak, um, in some cases. But when that happens, if you know that you can dispute it, then uh, then you are then you are per then you're perfectly good there. And I just removed your comment right there because a word slipped through. Um, and I try to keep this all, you know, family friendly because um, some people will watch this with kids on their TVs and stuff like that. So try to keep it all family friendly. So uh, see here, next up, we got Uku, the variety gamer. Um, they do gaming content. Uh, the goal is to eventually do YouTube full time. For now, I'm just providing entertainment and learning the process. The question, is there a way to affect the CPM or does it just change seasonally per month? Like do different game audiences have different CPMs or is it the same across all gaming content? Yes. Everything has uh, has different CPM. So it comes down to the people that are watching the content, the topics of the videos that you're choosing. Um, uh, like, for example, like let's say that you are playing Fortnite. There's going to be people that have very specific products that they're trying to sell to people. And people that play Fortnite could be one of their target markets. And therefore, because of that, they might end up paying more money for ads for that. Or they might you know, compete with other companies for higher ad rates to get in front of those audiences. So, you know, that type of thing can absolutely happen and cause, you know, a, a difference there. 
Uh, next up on the list here, we got the Manifold Hustle. Manifold Hustle does crypto related mainly on how uh, certain crypto projects work and also how to earn from them. The goal of the channel is to get monetized and help people learn more in depth about a project. And the question is, I'm wondering if I could add lives and shorts to my channel. I usually don't have a lot of time. And a lot of the time um, that I do have is used on the thumbnail and editing, which is very time consuming. I'm thinking if I had lives and shorts, I could cut some of the time spent on formal edits and thumbnails. Um, yeah, you can do that. You can experiment with it um, in terms of like, hey, let me try. Like when you, when you are mixing live streaming into what it is that you're doing, you can take different approaches. So one approach is to where you're going to do, you know, something like I do to where it ends up taking a long period of time. And in some cases, you might have been able to make a video in the amount of time that you spent, you know, live streaming. Um, and then there's other things to where, like I did this when I was doing the news content, which Renee, if you're still in here, um, I'm going to be starting that up again soon, as soon as you guys start busting those features out. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, when it comes to live streaming, one of the things that I would do with that content is I would just make the content live. So technically, and I did video versions of it too, but technically, like I could make a video, you know, for those, which I did uh, for a period of time to see which one performed better. But the th the cool thing with the live streams is that I could just do the research while I was at like Starbucks or, you know, like whatever put all my notes together, come in and then just like slam out the news real quick in like, you know, five to 10 minutes and then in the live stream. So when I was doing that, I was not um, interacting with the chat. When the thing first started, I'm like, welcome to YouTube Creator News, where I keep YouTubers like you up to date with everything that's happening on YouTube. Um, and then I would get into the news, right? So basically, I had that initial thing in there to let people know what was going on, got to the content, let creators know exactly what they needed to know, maybe tossed in some opinions on it here or there, maybe how they might use it or where they might find it in their creator studio, stuff like that. And then I ended the video. Um, so it was all camera and no interaction at all. But by doing that, I was able to essentially make content live and some of those videos did really well. So when it comes to live streaming, you can take different paths. It just, it's just deciding on what you think is best for what it is that you're trying to do and what, you know, what is best for the you know, big picture goals that you have for your channel. Yeah, in some case you can swap them out. I'm not doing videos anymore, I'm just on live streams. In other cases, it's like, eh, my live streams don't do as good because, you know, I can't create as good of an experience because I'm doing everything on the fly compared to putting together a nice, you know, presentation through through a piece of video content. So next up, we've got uh, Sir Tedrick. Sir Tedrick, um, they do, they upload when they have time. They've been on YouTube for less than a month. They do Let's Play content. The goal says I would like to grow and connect with the community. The question is, um, I hope all is well and thank you for reading this if you do. My name's Tedrick, and I've been wanting to make a new YouTube channel with Let's Plays and hoping to grow and connect with others. My question would be, should I start uh, with trending games that the big YouTubers are playing as well as starters, or sh shall I just play what I enjoy, or shall I stick with a specific genre or a play style? I think this is the biggest thing that I'm struggling with, with to start. So if your goal of your channel is to grow and connect with the community, right, if that's legitimately what you're trying to do, in that particular case, Start playing the games that you like to play because the games that you like to play are the ones that you're going to be the most passionate about. And when people are interacting with the content, they're going to be able to tell that you really enjoy playing those games. So because of that, if the goal is to do is to grow that community, then grow a community of like minded people around things that you also enjoy. Um, if the goal is simply like, hey, I'm trying to grow this as big as I possibly can. Um, and you know, at all by all means, I'm just gonna, you know, just put out the content content that that people respond to and you know that's the only thing i'm focused on then in that particular case yeah go for the popular games and you know try to figure out a way to stand out against all the other people that are making content about those games um but if you're like hey i want to grow a community and i want to like really enjoy this and share my passion for these games and all that then in that case play what it is that you enjoy but also be strategic about it be intentional about what it is that you're doing think it through in terms of okay over the next you know 30 to 90 days i'm going to be publishing x amount of times on my youtube channel for for long form content, X amount of times for shorts. If you're going to get into shorts, I'm going to be doing like let's plays to hang out with my community, like, you know, once a month or once a week, whatever you want to do, but basically figure out the content you're going to publish in terms of the, the cadence of the content and then start filling in the blanks. Okay. I'm going to publish this. Then I'm going to publish this. Then I'm going to publish this. Then I'm going to publish this. And then as you're filling in those blanks, start thinking, okay, if I am going to publish this video, then that next video that I'm going to publish that following week, why would these people that watch this video, why would they care about this video? 
and then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat for everything it is that you do, but just do it around that, do it around that game or the games that you, you know, enjoy playing the most. <clears throat> and if you play multiple games, if you have something to take off, I would follow that path, you know, at least for a while for the momentum and, you know, just, just basically double down on that game and that type of content. And then once you're like, okay, I've had enough of this, then start introducing new games, use your community feed to start pulling your viewers out of that audience that you built in that community that you have, start using your community feed and start using polls and everything to start understanding the other games that they play so that you can, you know, make a calculated move into um, other games as well. Next up, we got Max HP. Max HP, um, they do daily content, automotive. The goal of the channel is to do YouTube full time travel and to get experience uh, into experience cars. The question: When should I expect to hear from sponsors? I've been posting shorts daily and long form weekly for eight months now and haven't missed a day. Grown to twenty one thousand subscribers, but still no sponsors reaching out. Reach out to sponsors. So it's not always incoming. Um, so you might not even be on their radar. So of course, you've got 21,000 subscribers, which means that you've probably gotten a decent amount of views to get there. Some of that is probably short. Some of that is going to be long form. But when it comes to sponsors, you need to be on their radar. So right now, you might not even be on their radar. So what you want to do is if you make a video about any of their products or anything, any of their cars, things like that, start adding them on Twitter, um, letting them know, right? Like, hey, here's a video I made about, you know, this, you know, here's a video I made about Tesla. Here's a video I made about this. Here's a video I made about this product, uh, this, you know, seat cover or whatever the thing is. Um, uh, go on LinkedIn, do the same exact thing. Start connecting with their influencer marketing people um, on LinkedIn. Start following them on Twitter and interacting with them there. Um, put yourself on the radar. Um, if you, if you want to go through the effort, you can also start sending out emails. You are in the automotive space. I have a uh, friend was a previous client that, um, that is also in the automotive space and with them to get sponsorship deals. Basically they had major car companies that were sponsoring their YouTube channel. And the whole thing was they started going to events and they started networking with the people at events. They got to the point because they're so efficient at networking and they look at this whole thing as a business. So they started going to the events. They worked their way up to where uh, basically they were interviewing CEOs of these car companies, which then opened up even more doors because then they started being viewed as a person of authority and all that. So it opened up even more doors. They started getting flown all over the planet to go, you know, be the first, per, you know, some of the first influencers to look at cars. They started going to all the different car shows all over the place, ushered by, you know, the major car companies, um, all of that stuff. But the way that it happened was I told them exactly what it is that I'm telling you in terms of like, don't wait for it. If you, if you are going to try to do the sponsorship thing and you're going to try to do it professionally, then start working on the process of a sales system to where you do outreach and then you follow up on that outreach. And then through all of that, you will have people that will come through for you once they, you know, see what it is that you're doing, see the value in what it is that you're doing. They see that you're a person that is either of authority or is becoming of authority to where people will take your, uh, you know, take your suggestions when you're like, yeah, this car is amazing or this car sucks or whatever the thing is. When, when they believe that your viewers will take your recommendation, that's when everything will start changing. But you got to put yourself on the radar. Um, let's see here. Next up, we've got, <clears throat> um, let's see here. Oh, Doug just said he's taken over 2024. Nice. Love it. Staking his claim, as Brian D. Johnson would say. Uh, chair yoga with Barbara is our next question. They do fitness for seniors. The goal is to help seniors around the world and get monetized. And the question is, what ideas do you have to meet the 4k hours mark because of the wrong 365 day window? I keep losing hours and get nowhere. So this is part of the journey of being a new content creator. So one, make sure you're uploading on a consistent basis. So you continually have content going out. This is going to help you in a number of ways. One, you're going to keep putting videos into the system. And as you put videos into the system and people respond to those videos, every minute that somebody watch is got, watches is going to count towards that 4,000 hours. Um, in addition to that, you want to also make sure that while you're doing that process, that you're also focused on learning how to improve the response that you're getting on your videos through paying really close attention to how people um, click on your videos. The, the things that will impact that is going to be your topic, your thumbnail, and your title, and the auto replay or the auto play. Um, and then once they come into your video, start focusing on on how people respond to your videos and start learning how to make better better videos that people will watch longer. Once you get good at that, then the watch time will start taking care of itself. Um, from there, 
start making it very easy for people to find more of your content. So if you have people, especially if you're you know making content for older people, make it easy to where you can tell them at the end of your videos, Okay, so you know if you found this helpful, I've got another video that helps you with X, Y, Z. I put a link to it right here. Go ahead and click on that right now, um, and then you know I'll be over in the next video. So I'm going to wait a second here, just so you can go ahead and click on that. Go ahead and click. I'll see you over there. Right. Um, make sure that you're pinning comments with links. Make sure you have links in your descriptions, going into playlists that are helpful. Um, also. Another thing that can be helpful for your 4,000 hours of watch time is when you are uh, putting your videos together, start thinking instead of one video to where it's like, okay, I'm going to make this video about this. Start thinking, okay, I'm going to put together this series of videos. It's going to be like three to five videos, and it's going to take people through a certain thing that I'm trying to help people with, in your case, fitness for seniors. So maybe one is just flexibility, and it's your top five videos on flexibility. That is going to be like a must watch for people that are just trying to, you know, work on their flexibility as a senior, right? Start thinking content sets instead of, you know, one video at a time. And by doing all of those things that I just mentioned, that's going to help your, that's going to help you get that 4,000 hours, uh, faster. But when it comes to consistency, not only are you um, not only are you publishing uh, videos on a regular basis, but you're also working the process into your lifestyle of ideation and creating and publishing content, which will also <clears throat> um, become valuable because then that will also ensure that you'll be able to keep doing the thing. To buddy in the house, what is going on, Stanley? Hope that you are doing fantastic. Nice to see you in here, my man. Hope that you are doing great. Thank you for swinging by. Super appreciate it. Um, so you're next up on our list here, we've got Crojo Corner, Crojo Corner. They do crochet content. The goal of the channel is to entertain other crocheters by sharing patterns and ideas and also making some income. The question is, if I delete my older irrelevant videos, will the decrease in total view count hurt my channel? So one of the things that Renee mentioned earlier is it removes those videos from people's recent watch history, which then can impact the people that it's being recommended to. In addition to that, you're going to lose the public view count and the public watch time for those videos as well. So if you're trying to get to the partner program, then it can work against you because you're going to be removing watch time. Or if you're trying to maintain in the partner program and you're, and you're kind of cutting it to the line, then it can put you in a situation there. Next, we got Real Life with Ollie. Uh, they do decluttering and organizing your home content. The goal of the channel is to help motivate people to become less stressed and overwhelmed with their messy homes. The question, I have a recent video that was really, that was doing really well for me. The next week when I uploaded my next video, the momentum on that other video slowed way down. The newer video is still doing pretty good, just not in the same level as the other one. Does this normally happen? It can happen. Keep in mind, sometimes it's just timing. So when you publish a video on YouTube, um, you know, you have that first seven day, you know, cycle that you run through and it can, it can keep going right after that. But basically that first seven day cycle, sometimes creators will see like after that seven days and things just kind of, you know, will start tapering off a little bit. And sometimes that just comes down to like your upload cadence and, and that sort of thing. Um, but but if it slows down now, it doesn't mean it's going to stay slowed down. Like it might pick right back up at any moment. Um, it could also just continue to accumulate views over time if people enjoyed it, which they clearly did if it did really, really well. Um, in addition to that, when you publish that new video, keep in mind <clears throat> that even though YouTube is always testing, you know, your videos against people, there are priorities. So if you publish a new piece of content because YouTube values recency, um, in terms of, you know, you publishing. So when you publish something new, then YouTube tests that content against people. So if you have two videos and those, you know, two videos are being tested against, you know, people, then, you know, some of those same people, you know, the, the system might have to make a choice, right? Hey, should we show them this video or this video? So because of that, you can run into situations like that. They'll probably end up seeing both of them, you know, anyway, if they're enjoying your content, but for maybe like a new person, you know, might have to prioritize one over the other. I mean, it's kind of like that for your whole library. Next on the list, we've got English Fun Zone sliding in. Like if there was Indiana Jones, like grabbing his hat, you slid in right there for that. So the goal of the channel is to offer fun, informative videos in English and earn money. And the question is, I see a lot of other channels use movie clips to explain grammar or pronunciation. How do they do this with it being copyrighted? I know it, uh, I know it should be fair use, but I'm afraid the videos will not be monetized. I had a video demonetized because I used a very short clip from a sitcom and I had to remove that part. Is there a site that is YouTube friendly? Yeah. So I would try to avoid that if you can. 
um, uh, because you'll probably keep running into that same situation. Some people are fine giving up the ad revenue. Like some people are fine working for free essentially. Um, so, you know, if they have other ways they monetize, sending people into courses, you know, things like that. Um, for some people, you know, that's fine. They sacrifice the ads so they can do things like that so that they can ultimately end up getting in front of people that will, that they'll drive into courses or just monetize in other ways. Um, but yeah, I, I would just try to avoid that, um, if you can, because, um, uh, like using it in that way, you're using it to support what it is that you're doing. You're not necessarily talking about the, the clips that you're using. I mean, I guess you are, but you're using it like without those clips, you wouldn't be able to make that content, right? So in terms of using those as the reference. So because of that, it's really tricky um, in terms of, you know, the fair use side of things. So yeah, just be careful there. Perfect timing. We just cleared the form. So like uh, that was the last question. That's what I meant by the uh, Indiana Jones uh, reference right there. So that was the last question. So I'm going to take a, a question or so out of the chat. So if you did just join us, you know, go ahead and uh, just put a cue in front of your question. Actually, you know what? I'm actually uh, not going to, I'm actually not going to do that because I do need to uh, make sure that I can get uh, this uh, into Opus, which has a three hour limit currently, which is going to be lifted soon. Then I won't have to do that. So because of that, if you are a new content creator first for everybody, here in just a second, they're, they're on channel reviews on the StreamYard channel. So as soon as I end this stream, it's going to send everybody over there. So if you want feedback from people that know what they're talking about on your YouTube channel, then make sure that you do stick around for that. Again, as soon as I end this, it's going to send you there. But if you're a new content creator, keep in mind, like I mentioned before, YouTube is a learning curve. Embrace it. Don't get frustrated. Just identify where you're at in the process. Acknowledge that and acknowledge like, hey, I'm getting started with all this stuff. Don't give yourself a hard time about it. Just embrace the process and try to learn what you can. And by learn what you can, I don't mean just learn about, you know, like YouTube, like, hey, how do I get more watch time and stuff like that? All that's also important. But the skills, learning the skills that you need to be able to do the thing is the most important place where you can focus your efforts. So make sure that you are also continually learning the skills that you need, learn how to edit, learn how to make thumbnails, learn how to uh, write titles, learn, uh, you know, the psychology of viewers, all that good stuff. Um, that's how you get there. So thank you everybody so much for hanging out. Um, I will see you next Saturday at 9am Eastern. Have a great rest of your weekend and I'll see you next time.